Mm. I was, I was feeling, feeling that. that. Yeah. <laughs> hey. I think I'm hearing a slight echo, so I'm going to go and plug my headphones in. How about that? And I think we're live, peeps. We are. We're live. We're good. <laughs> right. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Good? Good, good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. So if you are just joining us today, my name is Tiana Camacho. I am a voice actor and I'm moderating this beautiful panel of black voice actors in celebration of Black History Month, which is every month. Anyway, let's go <laughs> and get started. All right. So do we want to make some introductions first? Yeah, let's do that. And um, we'll start from left to right and just keep it going left to right left to right left to right starting with og would you like to go first okay because i was like who's left who's right, <laughs> right. <laughs> hello my name is og banks the third og ie um i've been doing voice acting for a very very long time uh, since the 90s i would say the 90s um I, I had to do some history on myself to find that out um uh it's um it's great. I mean, um, um, what what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do right now? Just say who I am. OG. I do voice. You gotta over. hype yourself up. Yeah, hype yourself um, up. up a little bit. You, you Take the moment, man. This. You have heard me on this. You have heard me on that. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> You're right. I love that. That was amazing. I yeah, that was really to good. Answer your questions and to get to know you as well as you guys get to know all of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Beautiful yeah. and. Who's next? Would that be Cedric, babe? You want to go? Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. My name is Cedric Williams. I am a voice actor. I do voices for anime, cartoons, and video games. You might know me from uh, Demon Slayer. I play Syndro. You might know me from Ghost Force on Disney Channel. I play Glow and Greg show. Miller. Mm -hmm. Hey. Um, Leon, Pokemon Masters, G2, Hunter Hunter, Dawn, Promise Neverland, and a few other things coming soon. I am happy to be here to discuss the issues, have some fun, and uh, chill with my friends that are also voice actors killing it in the industry. Again. Ain't that right? My man. And then next up we have Adeto Kumbo. Is that how it's pronounced? You said it perfectly, so thank oh. you. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. I tried. Are you Sierra Leonean or Nigerian by, by any chance? Um, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ade Tokumba McCormack. I was born in Sierra Leone and raised in Nigeria and Kenya. I started my voice career at the tender age of 12 years old, doing little Fanta radio commercials and things like that. Hey. Uh, and I'm known for shows like Castlevania on Netflix and Blood of Zeus and a bunch of other things. And I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you coming. Mark, I believe you're next. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> immediately my throat closes up. Hi, uh, I'm <laughs> Mark Allen Jr. I, like many people here, I'm also a voice actor. Uh, you might know me as uh, Ukio and Dr. Stone, uh, the recently released Child of Kamiyari Month on Netflix. I play Yasha. Go! Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, lots of, lots of other things. I, I also roll around in a million other walks of life. Um, but I'm sure we're not here to talk about that today. So I will just be here filling my square and I will pass it right. But now we're right all curious. Oh, and well, so now right. you just got as curious. Right. Yeah. To what? Okay. I also make music. I DJ. I do <laughs> storm spotting here in Texas. That's so good. <laughs> what, what's your DJ name? I have I'm several like, monitors depending on what style of music I'm playing. So I got time. <laughs> <laughs> I realized. See, I was. We started this, and I was like, I don't need five minutes. And now y'all are making it take that long. Mark, <laughs> you got four minutes and thirty seconds so left. I want it all. Keep going. <laughs> okay. It's okay. You, you, you fine. We will. We will eventually talk about things like that, like the other things we do that inspire us. You know, and uh, we will also be taking questions from the chat. So. If there's something you don't want to talk about now, it'll probably be brought up later. Um, if you do want to go in depth about it, just letting y'all know. Bill, hon, you are next. Well, all right. Hi, I'm Bill Butts. 
He is. Love your voice, Bill. <laughs> he is. He is. Yeah. I do. Very good. Now, hey, guys, I'm a voice actor in this community. We're doing it for a black minute. Uh, you can hear me in a lot of shows, uh, like the animes and whatnot. But a uh, real talk, though, I'm King Gozzle, and that's how my reincarnate is a slime. I'm the bad guy in a ton of animes. I'm uh, Captain Jack, currently in One Piece. Uh, on top of that, uh, let's see here. I'm Odin, record of Ragnarok. I'm Bakuzan and One Punch Man, Chocolata, Just Bizarre Adventure. I'm the new Earl and Toe Jam and Earl and yeah. blah, blah, blah. List goes on. Watch my shows. Talk to my people. Let's go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Mela, I believe you are next. Honored to be here. My name is Mela Lee. You might know me as Lifeline from Apex Legends, uh, hey. Jade from Mortal Kombat, Green Postaka. From the Fate series, uh, my star EP Cross, Vampire Night. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Tiki and Fire Emblem, hey. um, Canary, Hunter Hunter. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. I'm knee deep in my dreams and happy to be here and really blessed to be on this panel with these beautiful people. Thank you. Oh, stop. Yeah. Keep going. So because I like blush over here. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, you'd see me blushing. <laughs> oh my god all right so we have aj and anaris next who would like to go first i guess I'm here. yeah um hi my name is anaris quinones uh i am a voice actress like everyone else uh i am puerto rican and black um and i uh whoo, uh I voice Rika and recently announced Jujutsu Kaisen. Let's go! Yeah. Let's go! Uh, go! Uh, Akinna in ReZero, Mirko in My Hero Academia. Uh, I'm blanking out on everything I've ever done. Wow. Uh, Nessa in Pokemon Twilight Wings, and that's all I can remember. Hey. <laughs> the Thord Art character. I feel oh, that. Oh, Mito! Mito, yeah. I love Mito. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, it's my turn now. Yeah, it's your turn. Uh, I'm fairly newer, but uh, my name is AJ Beckles. I'm also a voice actor. Um, I play Takamichi Hanagaki in Tokyo Avengers. I play Joko in Shaman King. Uh, oh, boy. I play Musashi in uh, Orient. The yeah. anime just, just dropped its first episode recently. Let's um, go! And a bunch of different other little things and cool things that haven't been announced yet. But yeah. NDA, NDA. NDA, NDA. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's the life. Big cat. He killed me in that show. Yeah, huh? <laughs> not allowed to say that, Bill. Yeah. I said what I said. It was the first episode. I can say what I want. You find out within the first five minutes. That's that's not a spoiler no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Statement. Right. I guess I'll just I'll list all the times I've died. Then, right? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you guys have gotten cast in something? And you're like, yes, and then you're doing the episode, and you're like, and I die. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. the majority of my career yeah. so until oh, recently. So so. Yeah. I got commented so bad. I had at least a hundred or so my lines in a show called Faraway Paladin. Five episodes in, long dramatic death. I'm like, and we're passing a torch. Oh, you die. Well, oh. it's happening, guys. <laughs> yeah. They brought me for bit parts in JoJo, and I got crushed by a car. So. Oh, no. I was oh, in 86 yeah. for, I think, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in for six minutes and then it's like bye yep that was it <laughs> it was fun <laughs> good time i had a good time all righty so i have a couple of questions prepared we will also be taking questions in the comments if you would like to ask a question of our panelists please feel free to post that in the chat and we will be moving on so with that out of the way, um, with the introductions all settled, some of you have already kind of done this already, where you've talked about your journeys and how you folks got started. Um, I was wondering if, if we wanted to, you know, unpack more of that and talk a little bit more about how we all, you know, you folks rather, since I'm just moderating, I want you all to have the floor, how, how you folks got started in voiceover, you know? To, to maybe talk about that a little bit. How was it for you when you were starting? Um, we'll start with OG. Me again, I'll start? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I started I started off singing. I was singing, that's how I started off with the microphone, learning the microphone in the mm -hmm. studio. I was Man. singing for a little while. Um, that didn't pan out. So then I moved, um, 
I was doing a little dancing and stuff and acting. Um, did Newsies. Um, was in that. Um, learning about the mm-hmm. learning about the industry and everything. Um, from the, I learned a lot from that. I I, I worked on Newsies for like a couple years. Um, after that, I went. Uh, my my on camera agent sent me on a um on an audition for this VO thing. Um, and um and I was like, what the, what's this? And um. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to the studio and they pointed to a picture on the wall and they said, Hey, um, you see that, you see that picture on the wall? I want you to take this script and make a character voice out of it. I was like, all right. Um, okay. I did my thing and I got called back a month later and that was like really my first job. And that was space jam. And that's wow. that was like, mm. that was back in the nineties. And I, I worked on that. Um, I worked on that for like a, a year. Uh, the the only thing that was wrong with that is Michael Jordan worked the year prior. I they did all the on camera stuff, so I didn't get to meet no Michael Jordan. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that was awful. But from there, um, Ivan Reitman is the one that I I met and um and I and um we really talked and he kind of showed me the way and um told me to really do this. I was like, yeah, I should do this and um. Uh, made a demo, met some, you know, agents, got myself an agent, um, Dean Panero, who's still my mm-hmm. agent till this day. Um, nice. And um, we've been like rocking ever since. And, and of course, um, um, I, you know, once I, you know, once I learned what, oh, a VO agency, I'm like, oh, you need to have a, there's voiceover agencies. I said, oh, I have no idea. I said, I had no idea. I said, oh, okay. So um I had to learn all that stuff. Um, but it, it's um it's been a great journey. I've been I've been learning a lot, been doing promos, you know, for the Disney Channel. I did that for like um several years. Um on to like, you know, you guys y'all know how it is, the dubbing, the animation, it all like it's just a, this industry, it's just it there's so much in this industry. I mean uh, Everywhere you go, you you're walking into a store and you hear you hear some voiceover. You know, you press a button somewhere at a amusement park, you hear voiceovers. It's I didn't everywhere. even realize yeah. how how voice was all around us. Commercials. I never really listened to the voices in commercials. Then I was like, wow, this is some serious. Wow, it's everywhere, and it's yeah. just growing and growing more projects. I remember back in the day when there was like. One cartoon movie coming out every five years. Remember that? Mm. And now it's like now it's like bam, 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 bam. bam. We got work, you know. Oh, it's man. like especially um, now with the yeah, pandemic. yeah. So I'm I'm just yeah. loving the industry growing, and I'm glad and so blessed to be a part of it and still growing with it. So. I'm very glad you said that too, because a lot of people really don't realize that we are everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, you go into the airport, you hear things over the loudspeaker. Here, like mm-hmm. even even on public transportation, yeah. they have someone recording all the street names. Well, yeah. and the the crossing Everywhere. lines, you know, the yeah. guy that tells you to walk when you're allowed yes. to walk. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. The person that they had to record. Yeah. So voiceover yeah. is everywhere. Well, it's so important, and I think it's so important to hear that human voice too. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I people say computer voice is like no, we want we want mm-hmm. that human touch. Yeah. Just so you know, it's like we're everywhere. It's beautiful. I think it's awesome. I think yeah. it's very, very powerful and oh, yeah. really cool. So thank you for bringing that up. That is very important. Cedric, hun, would you like to talk a little bit about your journey where, where yeah. that um, started for you? I'm from Kentucky and I moved to Los Angeles to do on camera, which I am still pursuing. But I noticed when I was auditioning for the Disney stuff and the Nickelodeon stuff on camera, I wanted... A, I saw, I would sometimes get like see voice acting auditions on like Actors Access and it really intrigued me. And I was on Craigslist and I was like, this is interesting. Oh, but I didn't really think too much of it because um, I had no previous acting training at all. And then one day I was watching YouTube and I see this guy, he makes, he's like just a regular guy, not a famous voice actor, just a dude who looked like me. He made a demo um, and he like, pretty much like put his own demo together and did a bunch of voices and something just clicked. It's called an epiphany, I believe. Um, And I was like, wait, I've been watching cartoons my whole life. I do voices all the time. I can do that. So then I, something just exploded. Um, 
I became a sponge. I started to look up voice actors uh, because I thought that cartoons were real and they didn't have people who the voices. So I, I know I was very immature, but uh, I found out that these people that I've been listening to my whole life have been voicing these cartoons. So I watch interviews, um, I listen to podcasts, um, and then I produce my own demo uh, that I still use today, actually. Wait, you um, produced your own demo? Oh yeah, you. yeah. That's amazing. Uh, it took three different versions to do, but and my method, I pretty much just uh, got sound bites from YouTube and like use a Blue Yeti mic and learn how to edit and did all that stuff. And wow. eventually, yeah. um, so I had to learn everything um, as I went. And eventually um, I got an agent, submitted it to studios, and then it just sort of went from there. And then I s sort of like, didn't really care to do the on-camera stuff. I still pursue it, but like voice acting has been so much fun. I can be free. I can be anything. I can. I don't just have to play things, uh, you know, of what I look like. I can be mm -hmm. a monster. I could be a different race. I could be an animal, and that's what really appealed to me. And um, yeah, it's been a great journey so far. <laughs> um, getting to work with my favorite voice actors, getting to meet new friends, and. Um, at first, um, when I first started doing anime, uh, there were some black voice actors, you know, OG, you know, doing, uh, uh, Naruto. Um, and then, um, uh, there was, uh, Bo Billingsley. There wasn't that many. So it kind of discouraged me a little bit, but I'm like, you know what? I I'm going to still pursue it. And then, you know, um, slowly, but surely it uh, started to happen. I do more cartoons, but like I'm slowly but surely um, after like in 2020, when Black Lives Matter started to happen, it started to give African-Americans more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And now it's like you see new people coming in um, and it's a beautiful thing. Like we're the pioneers. We're inspiring the next generation. Absolutely. And, you know, well, I'm really glad that you brought up um, being like if you're doing voice acting that you could be literally anything because we're gonna we're gonna come back to that point with a later question so thank you for bringing that up that is something i do want to bring up later <clears throat> Mello, would you like to talk about your journey and how that started for you um yeah i always loved music and and acting um made the mistake of listening to a professor in college she made it very clear to me that there was not really a whole lot of opportunity for people of color i should especially if you're a mixed race, there's really what would we do with you? Um, my biggest and probably my only regret in life is listening to that person mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I let that person define what was possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I did uh, disaster relief. I have a heart for first responders and disaster response. Um, went into banking because obviously, even though I'd done a few voiceover jobs, who makes a living as a voiceover artist? That was my thinking. It's like being a professional dodgeball player. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, then, um, you know, I was doing some anime um, and and a, and a little bit of ADR, which is post production voice and voice replacement, um, trying to pay off student loans, honestly, before I went to law school. And uh, what was beautiful about it is, unlike what the professor had told me, and and that just like what Cedric said, there was a lot more opportunity in voiceover because then it, I could be anything. And and just even though there wasn't as much opportunity for people of color, there was way more opportunity than on camera. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what's been beautiful in the last 10 years is to see from there being not, there was more opportunity, but nothing that, that looked like us to even in ADR, I could see the switch around 2010, 2012, um, being Mary Jane, um, some of the really great stuff on um, BET. Like there was just, what was beautiful for me, and I'm probably just going on too long, but uh, is- Take your time. The yeah, you're fine, you're fine. Mm -hmm. You're good. Diversity for people of color. Mm -hmm. It was really important for me to see reflected in entertainment and then in games and now in animation and, and on screen. 
because I, I know all of us have gone through this where they're like, we'd love some diversity. And this was probably like a decade ago. And they're like, so which kind of gang member can you play? <laughs> like, uh, uh, they're like, you know, like if I'm the darkest person, you know, and the most gangsta girl, you know, we have diversity issues. And all of to my urban folks who are making things happen. I mean, that's a very real issue. And it's not just color driven. Um, when I was doing disaster relief uh, with Salvation Army in St. Louis, um, incredible mm -hmm. boys that were like Croatian, Laotian, African. Mm -hmm. And so there was this beautiful celebration of culture. And, and I'm very proud that that rap and, and dance have, have inspired people from all over the world to express their authentic experience um, coming up in the world and in America. Um, but I... I met my biological father six years ago. So I always no. kind of knew mm -hmm. what my background was, but not like specifically. And so to meet my biological father, I'm sorry, cause you know, I'm just now talking about a lot of this. Oh, it's really to, nice. to, um, to be Princess Xanda in Black Panther's Quest and then mm -hmm. Jade in Mortal Kombat, um, Canary Hunter Hunter, um, Lifeline Apex Legends. And to get to celebrate that with my family has been really, really beautiful um, because those opportunities didn't necessarily exist. And um, I also didn't know where I fit in. And I remember when I got Jade from Mortal Kombat, I was nervous because I kind of started to feel the weight. And I think everyone here knows that there's this weight of representation mm -hmm. that now that we have diversity our voice matters and and like you know it's like we've come out of 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 a grand theft auto experience and like there's other <laughs> things we can be yeah, uh, yeah. And, um i said dad you know because i there's that feeling and i and 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 not to be controversial but there were times when people who are of mixed race we don't belong in either side we don't yeah. like you're like you're not really part of this conversation and you're like but i am <laughs> and you get to hear the slights from both sides against the other so you start to understand that you represent to both sides something that's maybe unacceptable and that my voice in, in this conversation means that people that look like me or my daughter someday if i have a daughter could just have the most beautiful gorgeous curls and and i want her to celebrate herself so what's what's my voice in this how do i celebrate humanity and the black experience in all its diversity and i remember asking my dad you know what what if i don't represent right and he said if they want to know what a beautiful black woman sounds like baby they just need to hear you open your mouth get to it yes and i think you know now there's blurs and nobody nobody really thought about that 10 years ago but we existed we were just like in the crevices and now we all see each other like oh phew, i don't have to you know i don't have to be a crack or forever you know yeah. <laughs> I think like me. So I think a lot of us, the diversity is amazing but we've all come out now as like well i actually do like uh, neuroplasticity and quantum physics and math i like anime and we're we're allowed to be all of these beautiful mm -hmm. aspects of ourselves. And I I champion games and animation um, for being really vanguards in that part of the industry to redefine possible for where you would see us, how you would see us, and how we would be represented in, in a, a grander scale of storytelling. That's a very beautiful, well thought out and profound answer. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing that. and um being vulnerable and mm -hmm. and expanding on that um and you know because i'm mixed too so i i get it i i feel like when people already decide they don't like us there we are suddenly whatever identity is easiest to discredit us mm -hmm. Oof. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how cool. it is what whatever identity is easy to discredit us and rob us of our voice to invalidate us, we all of a sudden, they decide that's what we are. Mm -hmm. So if it means that we get less opportunities, we're black to them. They don't want to listen to us, we're white yeah. to them. Yeah. And, you know, like I'm, I'm a biracial Puerto Rican myself. I'm black and Puerto Rican. So I thank you for sharing that. That is a very important conversation. I think more people need to, to have within the, um, context of diversity. So thank You're you. You're welcome. And thank you to the Black Lives Matter movement. 
that gave a face, like when you have thousands of people marching, you start to understand who supports mm -hmm. the movement and who is yeah. the movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really powerful to see ourselves reflected in that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your answer. Well said. Well said. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. So next, I believe we have Adeto Kupa. Yes. Yeah, I so I think you talk about my, your, journey, your amazing Castlevania. On by my the journey. Way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean your how you got started in voiceover and things like that. Ah, yes. I think I credit my mother really. I mean, she mm -hmm. studied elocution and was obsessed with you know proper diction and voice and speech and and so I it was just something that was logical, <laughs> you know, for me to to pursue. Um, and she also put me in a lot of poetry reading competitions. I think that's where I got my start. Oh. And, you know, and, and wow. you know, she's like, you better come first. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try it. And I just fell in love with language at a very, very early age. I'm talking about like six or seven. And, and then I did my first motion picture at 12. This is back in Kenya and <clears throat> Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Julian Sands, the late Leo Burmistone. And I just love that. And then you know, uh, some directors of uh, radio commercials were like, well, we like your sound. Are you interested in doing some radio commercials? And I was like, sure, that sounds like fun. And so from 12 to 17, I was doing all these radio commercials. So I got understanding as to how voiceover worked at a very, very, very early age. Yeah. And then when I got to college, I was like, voice and speech were my favorite classes, obviously. Uh. <laughs> Shakespeare and just language and I just really fell in love with Amber Cantabata and you know just all the different things you could do with you know antithesis and um, alliteration and it was just so much fun for me and uh, when I graduated and started working as an actor the voiceover department of my agency was like you've got this voice why don't we use it and, uh, and I said sure <laughs> But my worry, honestly, was that it goes back to what we were saying earlier about representation and people trying to put you into certain categories. Because I had a strange hybrid accent, people didn't know what to do with me, especially as an actor. But what voiceover did and what voiceover has continued to improve on is finding a place and saying that, yes, I exist. Um, just because I'm African doesn't mean I have to sound in a stereotypically African way, you know, and also it encouraged writers to start writing different characters, which we don't normally see on film and television and, and in animation. And I think animation, what they've been really good at is sort of paving the way for, you know, uh, theatrical and live action stuff to start catching up and saying, oh, well, you know, Isaac in Castlevania was written as a quite complex, interesting, robust Muslim you know, character, maybe we should write something like that, you know, for a character in the 15th century of color, you know, and, and it's just, I'm so happy to be able to do all these really incredible roles, but I'm hoping that, you know, it continues and does definitely start a trend in animation. And yes, thanks to BLM who have been so incredible at putting our issues to the forefront and showing that there is a huge, huge diversity and plethora of people um, like us in this panel uh, who exist and who have voices and who are important and who matter. And, um, and I think that this is only getting better. And so, yeah, I just, it's so exciting to see you guys and hear what you guys have to say. And, and I'm thrilled to be, to be part of this, this, this movement, I should say, so. Cool, that's Mom, amazing. Oh, love Heather. So sad. Cool. Mom, and very that's poetic. really cool that you're into poetry because I'm also very into poetry. That's awesome. Nice. Bill. You can come we first. talk a little bit about your journey and how you got started in voiceover? Oh, Lord have mercy. Uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> oh, no, Buckle in, everybody. No, here, we go. Go. Yeah, here we go. Uh, uh, Let me get my church fan. Hold on. You're right, Mark. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to try and like condense the story. This is a Q&A, not like I'm going to tell y'all like the next 30 minutes of my life. Uh, okay, so um, actually similar to... Uh, it's like a combo kind of between like said and at the combo. I just love saying your name, but uh, I actually started off. You said it perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, first try. Thank you, Black Jesus. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate it. <laughs> Got you, fam. Uh, I actually started off in radio. And I worked with the Cumulus Radio. Started interning there. Then started uh, doing commercials. Then uh, started teaching at a college radio. 
And uh, I had actually gone to school for uh, theater and journalism. So after a while, I uh, actually started doing that for a minute. Uh, the contemporary and Shakespeare, uh, it really changed my life, kind of gave me like a new love for it. After that, I started doing a film, got a good agent, and uh, did a bunch of commercials for like a, well, mostly a sprint actually. Did a radio commercials for uh, the KC Royals baseball team. And uh, <laughs> list uh, goes on there. And um, after a while, uh, my language choice in college was uh, Japanese. So uh, I was wow. going to a bunch of conventions while also uh, well, <laughs> doing acting work and competing internationally in film. And uh, I would go to these conventions, uh, and uh, you might have heard them if you're uh, oh, a fan of My Hero Academia. But uh, a friend of mine named Brandon and I uh, worked for this company called Babel, and we would bring Japanese bands over from uh, Japan over here to America, and uh, we'd MC and translate for them. So while going there, I had you know met some actors, and they were like, "Hey, why don't you you ever try you know voiceover, Bill?" I'm like, "I, I do commercials and on camera. That's just pretty fun." Yeah, what if we try like anime? I'm like, "I mean, I'll, I'll just." I'll give it a shot. So uh, September 2017, came out to uh, LA and I actually ended up on the Paramount lot for reasons I can't even explain. That's all, that's all God there. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, I didn't get anything, but like, oh, cool. So yeah. they said like, all right, Bill, you, I mean, you might want me to be union. So uh, after that, I came back to my hometown of Kansas City and I uh, booked a union sprint commercial, which played at uh, not only on television, but also at every home game with the KC Chiefs. Chiefs, baby! And, uh, you know, I had to go union. So I'm like, well, I guess it's time to go. So <laughs> I took a shot. I came out to uh, L.A. Right, we're going to run a roller coaster. Ready, guys? We're going to run a roller coaster right here. The ups and downs. So I'm like, all right, I love on camera. On camera. How would you like to play gang member three? It's like, uh, <laughs> Uh, if you see my resume, I, here's here's my my reel. Um, so you know, I'm looking for a new agent, and uh, I, I won the International Film Fest. Cool. All right, that's 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 cool. I, I would not like to be Slave Two or Crackhead Three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's wrong. Uh, I, I'm I'm trilingual. Uh, I have three black belts. Uh, Hello. Commercials. Is this is this, this good for you? Not not okay. Crack, okay, Crackhead Three. Cool. And um, <laughs> so. After that, uh, actually, huge props here. This is this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still condensed as much as I possibly can, so forgive me. Uh, it's okay. I, uh, I got Go to read on. for a little anime called Gundam, and uh, it was probably the most eye opening thing. It's like, all right, cool. So I read for it and uh, actually booked it. So I'm like, let's go. And it was the dopest thing when I realized I went for like two characters. I got one, his name is Sebastian Morse. And what I really wanted actually went to uh, one of my heroes named Bo Billingsley. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this is. And I pause and I'm like, hold on. First of all, there's multiple black people in anime. So I get like, <laughs> right there. <It's> amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, you already recorded him here. And I'm like, oh man, Bo sounds so good. Oh Lord. So I remember recording and it was like, a whole lot of eye opening things happened where like the client lives and I'm, I'm a dry, I'm an angel or Stephanie Shea was the director. And it's like, what's up in the ear? And Stephanie is like, hey, um, could, could you sound more urban? Oh. And I looked at her, and uh, I should have been fired for this. But I, I did I went like, he's in space. <laughs> he <yellow> is in space. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie like laughed and like looked over at her. Like, like, Bill, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> 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 God, if I had a nipple. Well, that's a dreaded urban voice. Yeah, I'm like, I was like, Jesus, I grew up in the, the hood of Harlem and in space <laughs> Mars. I don't know. No, space man. Harlem. You're right. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, um, after that. It's home for all of us. <laughs> Lord have mercy. The journey continued. <laughs> uh, now I'm with, uh, I'm in with uh, Atlas. I love him very much. Yeah. And uh, things are going good. Um, a lot has happened, but I ain't gonna make it all about me. Meetings are had. Uh, a lot of time talking with studios, and uh, all thanks to what started off with the, the BLM movement, and a lot of things happened. Folks got together, and it's beautiful to say the uh, things went from literally, oh, you're black, you can voice the black character, to like, you know what, fam? Let's just, we heard you, we, we, we're sorry. Just, you know what, just, we understand. 
this is what black sounds like because uh, we all went to the same schools as your white children. And I was like, sir, I have a full uh, props to you at that day. It was like, I have a little, uh, probably was, you find like 50 things in line where I, I love poetry and um, this is how uh, we talk. And uh, yeah, uh, now, you know, the boards, you know, even out there, uh, <laughs> I cried. I'm, I'm in my hero academia. I'm, I'm a, the lead villain in One Piece right now. Both ain't black, so I will take that in a heartbeat. So it's good. It's good. Here I am today with these beautiful people, and the day is like a bro. Your drip is amazing, man. I'm just mm -hmm. saying. Melody, Cedric the Entertainer, Tiana, OG, the Muhammad Ali. I seen you, brother. And the list <laughs> goes on. AJ and Naris and the Mark Allen Jr. Yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are right now. That's not me talking. This is a QA, not me giving you a monologue. Go in there. Go in there. <laughs> yeah, I got another question. How I see you in the gym nearly every day, and I never knew you had three black belts. That's wild. Mm. Uh, yes, that's a whole other story I will tell later. Or my life is yeah. very ridiculous. You should tell the story about how you kicked my butt. That was weeks ago. You recover fast, Mark. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so next. <laughs> We have Neris and AJ. I don't see AJ anywhere. So Neris, you just take yeah, it. Yeah, it's me. So, uh, gosh, I, um, I, when I grew up, uh, I was a shy, quiet girl, uh, similar to how I kind of am now. And uh, you know, I didn't really have an opportunity to get into theater. Um, so, you know, I think I had tried a couple of times, but like, you know, I had gone to like a Christian school and the most theater we had was let's reenact uh, Jesus uh, being born for the 58th time. Um, and uh, and then we started moving a lot. And so I never really had a chance to get into theater like anywhere because I never had a chance to settle anywhere and get into the community of any place. Um, so, you know, I kind of turned to entertaining myself. Uh, I read a lot. Uh, I loved watching cartoons and TV shows. And I always found um, the performances really interesting. And uh, so as I got older, uh, I eventually got into anime and I got introduced to uh, Fullmetal Alchemist, which is a superb uh, dub that I really enjoy. And, you know, the voice acting that really inspired me, I was so obsessed with it that I sat down to like, listen to the commentary track of the movie at the time, Concord Shambhala. Um, and Laura Bailey was talking about her process uh, when she auditioned for Lust. And, you know, she was talking about how Oh yeah, I was trying really hard not to make it like cookie cutter, you know, sexy character. Like I was actually trying to go for something with depth. And I was like, oh, it's like there's more to it. Like you think about it. Like I didn't, I didn't really process that, I guess. Um, and you know, at the time, like, you know, my first love is writing. So the whole idea of like there being a process, uh, analytical part of it, like that really appealed to me. Um and so, you know, I kind of just started off like doing impressions and stuff. And, you know, I was like 12 and I think I was doing like fan dubs, comics, like all that stuff. It was a hobby and it was really fun. Um, and I did that on and off, uh, I guess up until college. And then I think around college time is when it kind of became a side gig. Uh, and I would get paid every once in a while, but it wasn't really my main thing because um, one, I was kind of discouraged to get into it uh, because there was a lack of us in the industry and I could very much see it in every cast list that I would look at. Um, and also because um, because I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's not secure enough. So I'm gonna focus on my psychology degree and I switch between working at an anime store and working at a college and then working at a library, blah, blah, blah. Um, but every time I would do that, I just never felt content, fully content with what I was doing. Like, yeah, I was helping people and I love doing that. Um, but also, you know, I felt, I always felt more drawn to voice acting. And, you know, that's the thing that I would rather do um, that I would literally use my lunch time to like go do, like I would go home and like record auditions for things. Um, 
And uh, and then I booked my first anime, which was Kimono Friends. Uh, and I booked it while living in Florida, which, you know, at the time, you know, uh, booking talent that was out of state wasn't super common, especially for anime. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna go to Texas and record this. And I went to Texas and recorded it and I went into the booth and it was, it felt like home in a way. I don't know, there's something very nice about being in a studio, about, you know, getting to be in front of the mic. And I just, I still remember exactly how it felt to this day. And, um, and yeah, and then I just kept kind of being drawn to it, but didn't really fully get into it because I'm like, oh, but what if I move to Texas and then, yeah. you know, my talent isn't enough because of the color of my skin or because of my name, right? Yeah. Um, so I just kind of like, I guess, self-sabotage myself, talked myself out of it. Um, but then I booked again while living in Florida and I was like, you know what, screw it, I'll go to Texas. and. Uh, I ended up getting into all the studios pretty quickly then, but then I had a family emergency that led to me having to go home. I focused on that because family is first for me. Um, and I was focused on taking care of my family until the pandemic happened, which allowed us to record remotely. And, you know, I already had a setup that I had at home that was perfectly fine. So I was able to work quickly. And so when I got auditioned to Pokemon and my hero, I ended up booking and uh, and I never really thought I would be in this position of, I guess, getting to voice these uh, characters that are very important for the Black community, the Black anime community, um, and, you know, getting to inspire and be a part of change. Like, you know, I I never really aspired for that, but, you know, it means a lot to me because I, because I was hesitant to get into this in the first place because I didn't see myself. So to help others recognize, like, hey, you know, I can get into this because, you know, and Marys and Zeno and Cedric and Mela, because all of these people are in here and it's like, oh, that's cool. That's dope. So, yeah. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. Thank you, Marys. <laughs> hey, Dave, mm -hmm. would you like to talk about how you got started? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so, I guess I'll, I'll start off by saying that like anime and video games like really saved me as a kid. Uh, cause I was, uh, in the foster care system for a couple of years. Um, and then I finally had, I finally, um, you know, found a family, but when you're going through so many different foster homes and everything like that, the meaning of family kind of, uh, dwindles a bit and you, you don't know what that is. So, um, Naruto was a big, big deal for me because it's about an orphan kid who goes on to be, you know pretty much the president of his country and, and you know and he's and he's and he's fighting for his life just to get some sort of attention some sort of love and these people aren't giving him a chance or whatever and i really like vibe with that as a kid um and then video games and whatnot so as i'm growing up i i was like i want to be a basketball player um and then i realized i'm not going to be any taller than five seven so that's probably not <laughs> <laughs> grand hill baby grand hill <laughs> I did try them, um, <laughs> but uh, so so then I discovered art and I was like, oh, anime, what is this thing? Because I think it was a scholastic book fair in seventh or eighth grade um, that I went to and it was like how to draw manga, you know, and I was like, what's this? And I was like, oh, I know what this is. And then it wasn't like the most, you know, uh, detailed manga art. It was pretty simple. It was for kids. Um, and my friend was like, oh, no, my brother draws way cooler manga than that. And then he drew, uh, he showed me a picture of Itachi that his brother drew from Naruto. Um, and I was like, oh, I watched that. That's awesome. So um, my whole thing, I mean, ever since I was a kid, it was, you know, not to get dark, but, but you know, what are we going to leave behind? You know, what, what's going to be my legacy? Um, and I was like, well, Naruto saved me. So if I can draw or design a character like Naruto or like Kratos from God of War or something like that, that'll help touch so many kids like it touched me and that'll be awesome. So uh, I tried drawing art and uh, something that I always tell people now is like, if you stop loving something, um, it's okay for you to move on to other things. And it got to a point and I'm probably like a sophomore in high school now where I was like, I don't really love drawing every day, you know, trying to perfect my art or everything like that. And I don't know if I would be okay with having a job where, you know, I'm working for a major 
a video game company and they're like, we need 30 designs uh, by next week, you know, do it. Cause it was more of a, a passion for me. And I was like, I don't know if I want to make that into a job. So I stopped doing art for the sake of wanting to pursue an occupation and um, you know, I'll doodle every now and again, but you know, I don't need to, that doesn't have to be my job. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so uh, come junior year and the, uh, the pre SATs and the SATs and all that, and what college are you going to go to? What are you going to do with your life? I had no idea. Um, so one day <laughs> I'm sitting outside of my cousin's house, uh, just on the point, it was a nice sunny day out. And my cousin comes up to me and he's like, Hey, have you ever thought about doing voiceover? Uh, and I was like, no, I, mm -mm. uh, and he said, well, I know a guy and you know, <laughs> you can make lots of money. It's super easy. And you know, everybody's doing it these days. I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, okay, not true. <laughs> Not you at all. <laughs> but I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm down. I think normally I would have been like, ah, no, it's not for me. I don't know what this voiceover thing is in my head. Like Naruto was Naruto. SpongeBob is SpongeBob. It wasn't Tom Kenny. It wasn't Miley Flanagan. Uh, so I, I, I looked into it and I, and I and I did it. He did, in fact, know a guy. Um, and <laughs> I went into this guy's booth and he was like, yeah, this is what voiceover is all about. Here, you know, go into the booth, read some copy. Um, and I was like, okay. And I did it. And it was one of those things where if you find something, uh, sometimes you find something that you're just, it just clicks, you know? Um, and for me, it just clicked. I don't have any acting experience. Um, and growing up, I don't know, extracurriculars weren't really uh, a thing for me outside of basketball, you know, something I do after school or whatever. But for the most part, extra, extracurriculars weren't a thing for me because I was taking care of my grandmother who had dementia um, since I was like 12 in my family. Uh, was working all day. So I was, you know, left at home to kind of make sure she was all right and everything like that. So a lot of my time after school and those sorts of things, uh, like if I needed to go to a rehearsal or something, you know, I couldn't do that. Um, not that I had any want to do that, but I couldn't even if I wanted to. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was always good at reading, uh, cold reading, because growing up, I got in trouble a lot. <laughs> and when I got in trouble, uh, you know, I couldn't play my Game Boy anymore. I couldn't watch TV. I had to read. So um, I was in like second, third grade reading at a sixth grade plus, read, you know, I was uh, reading level. So I was always good at reading. I was always an extrovert. I think that need for attention due to trauma, <laughs> you know, uh, I was always kind of a class clown and everything like that. So when I was in the booth, I felt free. Um, and it didn't feel like basketball where I was too short um, or anything like that. I, I wasn't worried about my my skin color or anything like that, because I think more than anything, voiceover is the thing where it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. You can be anyone, you know, even if you're on theater, you can race bend roles and stuff like that. But like at the end of the day, people see you and they know you're black, <laughs> you know, it's, you can't take that away. But voiceover, there's none of that. It's just the character. And I love that concept and um, I got obsessed. I got really obsessed and I, I kind of like, like Cedric, I kind of looked up stuff on YouTube and everything like that. I taught myself how to act via, uh, via watching movies and stuff like that and just copying. Um, I had a good ear um, from, you know, I, I, I I don't have this weird thing. I guess when I was a kid, I, I listened to a lot of Michael Jackson and Jackson Five, um, and my voice tone was similar to Michael Jackson when he was a kid. Um, oh, I'm nowhere near as good as him <laughs> singing, but I think naturally because I listened to him so much, I kind of copied. Um, so my ear is good for copying things in general now. Um, so I kind of got obsessed with that. But I was still in high school. You know, I was around my senior year now, and I'm. I'm don't know what I'm going to do. And my mom's telling me, Hey, you got to go to college. You got to get some sort of degree. I don't want you to be homeless. <laughs> and I was like, you know, that's fair, mom. <laughs> um, so I um, went to Worcester State. I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, I went to Worcester State and I kind of just, uh, I joined communications because I was like, what's a degree that like kind of lets you, you know, it can lead to other things, but it's not like super crazy, like a biology degree or anything like that. It's just, you know, communication is cool. So I did that for a little bit and I was miserable. Uh, mm. for a long time because I was like, I know what I want to do. I want to be an actor. Uh, so I stopped doing communications around my sophomore year of, of no, junior year of college, actually. I switched to theater because I was like, well, I want to be an actor. I might as well, you know, I don't want to leave college, so I'll just do the theater. But my theater uh, program wasn't the best. And um, 
there was one day where I was talking to my academic advisor and we needed an advisor in order to get approval on our classes each year and, you know, go to them for advice. Um, and he was, he was a part of the theater program because they want to match you with the same program you're, you know, a part of for your major. Um, and he worked on stage crew. That was his thing. And he like designed sets for, you know, I, I don't theme parks and stuff like that. I don't know exactly, but I think he worked with Disney at some point, but he designed sets. And um, he was talking to me and he was like, what do you want to be? And I was like, I want to do voiceover. And he was like, Ugh, can you do a Daffy Duck impression? And I was like, no, I, I can't. He was like, well, how about, it's like, it's easy, just do it. And you know, here's how you do it. And I was like, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, he was like, well, listen, I tried uh, acting. I don't know if it's, it's a thing that uh, yeah. is very stable. I think you'd be good for stage crew. You should do stage crew. And I don't know, I don't know if acting is good for you. And I was like, Okay. What? Um, <laughs> and I thought about that for a little bit. And I was like, ah, I'm done with school. Um, luckily, <laughs> yeah. because of grants <laughs> and because of grants and, and, and uh, because I was adopted, uh, going to state colleges is, you know, uh, at least state colleges where you're adopted um, in Massachusetts uh, were drastically cheap because the state will pay for it type of thing. So I was pretty much going to college for free, very privileged. Um, so I was like, mom, listen to me. Uh, I'm not very happy right now. Mm -hmm. Um, please. I, I was doing voiceover at the time, you know, just auditioning online, indie stuff, cast and call club, stuff like that. And I was like, if I can just, um, just uh, take a year off, uh, like let me, if I feel like if I was able to focus entirely on voiceover, I could, I could do some great things. I've taken classes. I've been told by people that are been here that I could do this. I feel like I can do this. I just need the time. And I don't know if I'm loving taking a history class. If I don't want to do history or math, if I don't want to do math, I just I wasn't for it. So she was like, okay. And you know, every kid that says they want to take a year off usually doesn't go back. <laughs> so um, I didn't go back. This is, I think the end of 2018. So going into 2019, I had bought a booth um, because I was like, oh, you know, I could just, it's fine. I'll just, I'll, I'll get the booth and I'll, I'll um, actually, no, sorry. I lied guys. So 2019, I bought the booth. And then towards the end of that year is when I decided I didn't want to do uh, school anymore. So then next year, 2020, uh, you know, happening and uh, we all know what kind of happens around there, around the 2020s, uh, you know, the pandemic begins to start around the end of 2020 yeah. and, um, I good thing you got that booth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good thing I got the booth. I mean, because I saw it as an investment. I was like, I it's a lot of money. It was like eighteen hundred bucks. I I drove to New York. I drove to Brooklyn. Uh, so this guy, this voice, this voice actor was like selling his booth for like eighteen hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we my me and my cousin got a U-Haul and we drove down there, took it apart, and drove it back to Worcester, Mass. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> so I set it up in my room and I didn't really need it at the time, but I was like, I feel like I will one day. And I bought a subscription to Source Connect because I was like, I need it, so I got it and I could pay for it. Um, so I had everything I needed, and then I was working as a cashier at a grocery store. And then I mean, the whispers of COVID around the end of 2020. Um, uh, or was that the beginning of 2020? Oh my gosh. I don't even beginning. know. Beginning of 2019. Like March 2020. So yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, March 2020. So end of 2019. So end of 2019, the whispers of COVID. And I'm in, you know, working in the grocery stores and, you know, everybody's saying like, oh, China, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what? Okay. Um, but it's starting to scare me because I have a big family with comorbidity, comor comorbidity, comorbidities uh, everywhere. Um, and I was like, I don't feel comfortable working in a large grocery store with tons of people coming in and out and, and I can potentially hurt my family. So I stopped and then uh, I was kind of depressed because I wasn't really booking anything. Um, but then the beginning of 2020, uh, that's when it really kicks off. And around that time I had, I had booked my first big thing, which was a song, uh, a, a psalm of race and no, a song of race and ruin. This is an audio book um by an amazing uh, uh amazing amazing writer um uh, and um a black writer um and it was my first professional thing and it was around the time that you know everything began to shut down and they're like can you come into studio to record this and i was like no <laughs> i'm not going to studio yeah. i have a booth and they're like okay fine so i recorded i recorded that and then it was black lives matter started happening and it was the first time that i felt that like some a black person dying wasn't just a, you know everybody feels bad on and then it's over you know it was the first time where it was like i felt like 
wow, the world's actually getting that everybody's pissed off about this. Um, so I, a song of race and ruin came out and then that kind of, you know, people were pushing that because people were putting, pushing a lot of black creatives at the time. Um, and then that got me to like a thousand followers and I was like, yeah, that's a huge number. Um, and I, I just, I, it led to people kind of like the otherwise, I don't know, would have, um, uh, paid attention to me, paying attention to me and pushing my name along and stuff like that. And it didn't lead to crazy opportunities, but at least it got my name out there a little bit. Um, in the kind of shortness, so I'm, I'm done rambling, but, uh, uh, I kept working really, really hard. I kept working really, 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 really hard. And, um, it just, it led to opportunities, I guess. I never stopped believing in myself. I did more workshops online, met amazing people. I met Anaris and Zeno. I wanted to be the first black person to be the, like the head of an, you know, the, the main uh, protagonist of an anime um, that was like worldly renowned, like Naruto or something like that. And I saw Zeno book talks and I was like, oh my God, I, that's not just a thing that I'm saying. Somebody did that. Representation matters. Um, so I kept, I kept trying because of that. And, um, it led me now to my agency and, and CESD. Um, and I, uh, have Sam Freshman, who's just an amazing agent. Um, and I booked Takamichi and all that other stuff, but pretty much it took a lot of, a lot of grinding to get here. Um, and the Black Lives Matter and kind of the perfect storm for me to get here, but I'm here now. Um, and I'm happy to be. Sorry, I rambled for like 10 minutes. I am so sorry, guys. Well, I think but these okay. stories are so important, all of our stories, because yes. someone out there is watching and thinking, I don't have enough money, or I just dropped out of college, or I don't live in New York or LA. How can I make it if, if I, or I'm taking care of a family member and I need to stay. All, they're thinking yeah. that, that their situation in their life might prevent them from becoming who they were meant to be. And so these, all of these stories are inspiring me and, and AJ for you, it's really important that people with your story are thinking, okay, it's not about tons of money and who, you know, and it is about you being you and being persistent and following sometimes that still small voice. It was like, get a booth. Yeah. 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 My mom was like, why do we need to spend $1,800 on this? I was like, I don't know, but I do. I mean, <laughs> I okay. do. Um, and I'm from Mac, I, all of that stuff I booked. We just moved out to LA like three weeks. Oh, Tiana helped us, by the way, on our search to find an apartment. But we just moved out like three weeks ago. All of the stuff I booked mostly to this point was in Massachusetts. So it's it's possible you can do it from anywhere now at least. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I work really really hard. That's I love that story. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that with us too, because there are also people in the system that feel like they don't really, they they may not have the means to do it either. So the fact that you did come from foster care mm -hmm. and you are here among some of the best of the best of the industry, oh, yeah. sharing that and just unpacking all of that for us to whoever may listen really is is very important for whoever needs to hear it. So thank you for your vulnerability thank and you. sharing that with us. We really appreciate that. Mm. Um, we have one person left to share their journey. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Go pretty. So, so I will really try and truncate this because my story is very long and very sorted. Uh, some of the folks here actually know it because I've talked about it with them several times, but um, I kind of got the acting bug really late in life. I took a musical theater class my junior year in high school. Um, and I wasn't a solid singer. Um, and I've always had a very, I have a, I have a tall, lanky, awkward body. And so dance wasn't really for me. Um, much to my father's dismay at the time, cause he was a dancer. He did tap and jazz and, and he, he thought maybe I would too. And then I outgrew him by three inches, so he thought maybe not. Um, <laughs> and uh, but the acting was kind of fun. And um, up until that point, I had really been the the nerdy kid in my group of friends. I have uh, two two of my best friends I've known since you know sixth grade, and they were always the actors, and I was always the science kid. Um, but my senior year, I took acting one, and um, the class was was interesting. A lot of the stuff that they teach you your first year of acting is like here's how to play pretend and like i kind of already did that all the time anyway because I, mean, I was sort of the you know the class clown of my group of friends as well 
Um, and and so I kind of zoned out a lot of that. And then we got to the section on improv. And improv in particular spoke to me because I've always kind of had a very quick brain. And I don't mean that in a bragging sense, but I mean that like brag. It's okay. When, <laughs> when, when, Floor is yours. when you spend your childhood in books, um, you learn to move your brain faster. Um, I don't really know how to describe it, but you know, you you want to get through the stories faster and faster. You want to experience the the joy and and the fantasy and everything that you're reading. You want to get to it faster and faster. So my brain really just picked up the pace, and so my wit has always been pretty quick. And that meant that I really excelled in improv. It's very easy for me to just take what's there and then just go with it. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And so. Uh, I joined a high school improv group. It was one of the first ones in Los Angeles County. And um, we really, we, we got to perform on, on stages throughout LA. We got to do, you know, comedy sports and, and we did head to heads with other improv teams that were in college and adults. And it, it was uh, an incredible experience to, to just learn and really feel out uh, improv. Um, and that kind of led me to go, you know what? I think I want to be an actor but I'm not sure yet. Um, and my senior year of high school, I also took a drawing class for the first time. And I really liked drawing. Um, and I wasn't very good at it, but I, in, for some reason, uh, enjoyed it more, um, which was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we're all young once. So uh, I actually went to college uh, as an animation major. Mm. Uh, and after a semester of animation classes, I was on academic probation. And uh, what that means is that your GPA is so low, they're threatening to kick you out of college, uh, which is exciting uh, when you're a straight A student <laughs> all really through high legend, school. Uh, <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and I was like, you know what? Let me, let me go back to what I was doing. Let me try and get into acting. And so I changed my major to acting. And uh, at that school, you can't take acting classes in the spring semester. You have to start in the fall. So... My, now a year into college, I'm starting my first classes as an acting major, and my academic advisor wanted me to, to, in his words, stay with my age mates, which is nonsense, but it just led to me taking first semester and third semester coursework at the exact same time, um, and so I was taking 19 units, I was staging a play, at the time I was still in an improv group, I was doing martial arts, I was on a stunt team. I was doing way too much um, and ended up you have to do what's called jurying after your third semester where you basically sing a song, perform a monologue, perform a scene in front of all the acting teachers and they get to decide if you stay in the program or not. Ooh. So for those playing the home game in my first semester of real acting school, I'm competing with everybody else in the program to figure out if I can stay in the program. Um, I did my juries. I was of the of the. 26 people in my acting department i was one of 10 selected to pass the juries but in all my uh amazing time management um i had elected to not do a lot of busy paperwork stuff for one of my first semester acting classes and the professor there uh, did not want to give me any extra credit no bonus work i needed a b minus to pass the class i got a c plus and so I was going to have to repeat that class, which meant I couldn't do any of the next coursework. And I couldn't repeat that class again until the next fall. So, yeah, ended up changing my major again. Uh, by the time the next fall rolled around, I was a Japanese major, which is what I finished college with. But by that point, I had already kind of bitten into voiceover, actually. Uh, Christina Valenzuela, better known as Christina V., uh, was good friends with one of my best friends from high school. Uh, they went to college together and Christina was telling my friend Elena about voiceover because Christina was starting to do a lot of, a lot of big things in voiceover around that time. It was like 2006, 2007. Um, and so uh, at a, at a party that my friend was hosting, Christina was there and we got to talking about voiceover and I had had ambitions as a kid of doing movie trailers. Um, I grew up, just a mad fan of Don LaFontaine and his voice and, and all the crazy, just amazing bravado and, and, and just, uh, he was a master. Um, and I had it in my head that maybe I could do that too. 
but I didn't sound like a man until about three years ago. So that <laughs> is- <laughs> trying to get there too, man. <laughs> so, um, so I started looking into what other things I could do and I've always enjoyed entertaining. And again, with my improv background, comedy always really kind of spoke to me. So um, I started looking into doing animation and that led to me uh, having a lot of really interesting opportunities to try out for children's animation. Um, and that was a big deal for me too, because one of my first jobs was a babysitter. Um, I've always kind of worked closely with children and, and you know, helping kids with homework. And, you know, I'm, I'm the second of six kids. So I always had younger siblings that I was helping out with. Um, and so being a part of children's animation was always really special to me. And I got to do a couple of projects there, but ultimately they just, it, for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. I guess people just decided that I didn't have the right sound for that, which was, you know, that's the industry does that all the time. Mm. Um, but through connections with Christina, um, I actually ended up uh, starting to get opportunities in anime as well. Um, and that really took off between about 2012 and 2015. Um, I had the opportunity to do uh, a lot of background work, Walla and bits and, and, and just coming in for a lot of wild and crazy uh, uh, projects. Um, never booking any leads, but that didn't matter to me because it was, I was still doing it, you know? Um, I was getting the opportunity to perform and, and with my improv background, being able to jump in a booth and then they go, you know, okay, you're a, uh, you're a cow warrior whose arm is being sliced off by the enemy. Go, okay, I could do that. And then they go, great, that was great. We're going to move on to the next bit. Okay, now you are a scientist. You've just discovered the cure to cancer. And okay, go. And being able to just kind of uh, switch on a dime like that and have an option and come up with something um, was really my strong suit. And and I I think that's been the majority of my career is just being able to be relied on to do just basically everything, which I pride myself on. Um, But right around 2015 this weird thing happened where everyone in the industry simultaneously decided that because i was black i should only be reading for black roles um regardless of of the fact that i had you know eight years of experience behind me and i had a resume that showed the kinds of characters that i could play all of a sudden the only auditions i was getting was for the gangbanger and for you know the the rapper and i can't rap um, you don't want me to try. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> you know, so it, it was a lot of opportunities for roles that I was never going to book. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to book them and I would still read. And then I would send an, uh, an email to the person who sent me the audition going, Hey, you know, are there other roles for this show? I'd love to, you know, have the opportunity to read for something that maybe fits me a little better and always kind of got the same response of, well, we'll, we'll keep an eye out or, you know, we'll, 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 hopefully we'll have something for you in the future. And it just kind of stayed that way for a couple of years. Um, And in 2017, after basically two years of never working, um, I had the benefit of having a job that could travel with me. Um, I'd had a series of bad roommate situations where I moved seven times in two and a half years. And if you've ever lived in LA, moving once is enough to destroy your wallet. Um, you know, there was a, a brief period of 20 days where I was homeless and just like bouncing from people's couches using their internet connection so I could do my job. Um, and and uh, finally, I had a friend, an online friend, by the way. So don't ever let anybody tell you your online friends aren't real. Um, I had an <laughs> online friend say, hey, you know, I saw that you were thinking about maybe moving out to Texas. I have a house. If you want to just come by, you can rent a room. You know, we're, we're happy to have you. And uh, and I I took the jump and I did it. Um, And my first year out here was kind of like starting all over again. It was, you know, I had 10 years of experience, but it was like, I was the new kid on the block again. No one knew who I was. No one knew what I could do. So I started again. I did the same thing where I just worked really hard at being very good at doing the bits and walla when they needed me, whatever it was, just do it. Um, And now the last three years have been, the most successful years of my entire career because people gave me a chance. People decided that there wasn't a sound I was supposed to have. I Mm. sounded like me and that was something they could use. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, kind of like, like Mela said, when you are 
mixed race and when you grow up mixed race, you're, you're very used to hearing that you don't fit in. And so it was a big shock for me when far in my career, suddenly it was decided what I was supposed to sound like um, and having to adjust to that and figure out what to do. Um, you know, I, I've told this story a lot of times, but um, my stepmother uh, passed away in 2015. And one of the last things she made me do was promise that I wouldn't give up on my dreams. And, you know, that was right around that time when I wasn't booking and I was getting all these awful <clears throat> roles in my inbox that I was never going to book. Um, and she, despite being in the final months of a battle with, with, um, sorry, with, with, uh, with MLS, uh, she knew she could see it in my eyes that like, I was thinking mm. about giving up and she told me, she was like, don't you dare. <laughs> so I, I didn't. And, you know, I, I work every day to make sure that I can at least make her proud and keep doing what I'm doing. And that's, that's honestly the thing that has kept me going longer than anything else, because there've been so many times when, you know, despite all the amazing opportunities I've had so many times where it was like, Hey, it's not working out. Maybe, maybe you, you know, you have all these other passions. Maybe you should look into those, but this was always the one that spoke to me. And so uh, we're, we're off topic, but I just want to say, you know, to anybody who may be struggling with it, you know, I didn't even book my first lead character until my 14th year as a voice actor. You know, you, you, it, it's not, it's not an overnight thing for the majority of people. It takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication. And if it's really what you got, what you want to do, you got to do everything you can to do it. And I hope more people really, you know, if you have to stop for a couple of years and take time for yourself, work a job uh, so you can afford to live, you know, take care of family or whatever you have to do. That doesn't mean your journey's over. It's just on mm -hmm. pause. You can always yeah. come back to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's, that was very well said. If, if, I, if I may say, like, Mark, it's it's what's super interesting when you said that, like, you know, all, all of a sudden people find out you're black and they try to start putting you in a box. Um, it's really weird. I remember growing up my whole life playing video games, you know, and I'm talking to people on Xbox live chat and everybody thinks I'm white. But all of a sudden, you know, so so but all of a sudden when I joined the industry, everybody's like, let's give them all the black roles. It's like what? very weird that my skin has so much to do with this when people yeah. that are outside of this industry that hear me assume I'm white. So why well, is this? It's, it's even more fun than that because I grew up and, and because I'm fair skinned and because I, mm -hmm. I present so many aspects of all the different backgrounds that I am mixed with, mm -hmm. you know, it was not uncommon for people to go, wait, you're black Yeah. to my face standing yeah. and talking to me. Wait, you're black? Oh, I didn't yeah. know. You know, I've gotten everything from Middle Eastern to Sri Lankan. To someone thought I was Hawaiian, and I was like, I, "These, all these ideas, you could just ask me." <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. But, but it is like you said. The minute, the minute I started really, and and it was as an adult because growing up, I I didn't know where I belonged, and as an adult, I really wanted to, I wanted to be black. Not in the sense of like I wanted to emulate what other black people were, but I wanted my identity to count as black. And yeah. so in trying to explore that, more people publicly became aware that I was. And I, I feel like that somehow affected their idea of, of who I was and what I could do. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's my name's my name's Akeem. And I changed my name to AJ so that, you know, because I was worried that people would be like, oh, like you're. Akeem is not a white name, so we're mm -hmm. not going to cast you. I was very worried about that. That's why I started going off of AJ. Now it's just you know easy for people to spell, and I've, you know I've been having it for so long. It is what it is. But I'm never afraid to tell anybody my name's Akeem now. But I was very scared of that. Yeah, and it's good to see that like just three years ago, it might have been four. Um, Zeno and I were talking about this phenomena at the beginning of diversity, where all of a sudden we were only being allowed to read for black roles and and Zeno was like I could play any of these roles why am I not reading for the lead in Spider-Man why am I not yeah. and and just know that your voice and your questions and your panels everything matters because Zeno obviously has pushed past that um and I know you have too Mark but just that mm -hmm. it's really important now I don't know why I didn't have the confidence until even you know Black Lives Matter where 
you were just so thankful for the job because we didn't get them that sometimes if somebody was writing something a little askew, you didn't feel like you had the power to go, that's not really what I would say, or that's not authentic. And what I see now in, in, in working with some incredible gaming um, franchises and in, at Disney and Amazon and Netflix, they'll ask. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. You know, and instead of it being like, I've had auditions where I would just read it and they're like, great, but how would you read it? That <laughs> meant, <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm that meant, you know, more urban. Oh, you know? God. Oh, can, we just, God. can we all collectively agree We've that the word urban that. needs to be struck from all casting? Yeah. 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 Um, well, unless it means someone who is from the city and it could be any color, but there is an experience to living yeah. in in an inner city or, or in yeah. poverty or in, you know, an industrial. Yeah. But, but, but then, you know, like Detroit is different from LA is different yes. from Miami yeah. and they're yeah. all urban. My so. first and first failed AA. I didn't know what AA was when I first got here. I had an, um, and you guys might get agents and they might not be the right one. We've all have agents that like have hired you for a reason and then they don't represent mm -hmm. you very well. <laughs> so I a couple of those, but I remember the first one I, I had, they were like, oh, we've got a perfect read for you. Please come in and can you drive in? And this was olden days when you had to drive to the studio. And I, um, <laughs> and I, I went to the agency and I opened it up and I was in a room full of fellow people of color and it said AA. My character was AA. And I was like, so I'm a former alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, AA. And I was like, Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> you know, African American. I said, great. So where is she from? They're like, African American. African. <laughs> my mom's here in London. And so I'm like, so, but what city? Because it makes a big difference. Yeah. And they're like, you know, urban. <laughs> Come on, I, like, so you know, I hate that word so um, much. So it doesn't right. tell me anything. There, there was the point where um, I was not booking black characters because I don't sound stereotypical black. So I had to ask OG and Jason Lanier White and Zeno, how do you do that black voice? Please teach me. And I, I think I really ran, ran into Phil Lamar at one point uh, at an audition and asked him. And, uh, you know, and they told me these different techniques. And so now whenever I'm, you know, I'm playing a black character, the cast, the, the director just says, just sound like you. I don't have to use right. that. Yes. Like you can black you voice. Can that was Bill, told. I have called Bill yeah. several times and been <clears> like, <throat> hey, man, there's this role. I don't know if I'm black enough to play it. Mm. And like I, I've played Black Panther. So mm. it's kind of mm. like. I should be black enough to play anything, yeah, but I still have these moments of panic where I'm just like, man, if I book this role and it comes out, like, is the community going to accept me as being proper representation for them? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's terrifying yeah. sometimes. There's this weird. Hold on, like... I'm going to say something real quick. Yeah. First of all, Mark Allen Jr. is your full government name real quick. <laughs> when I came out to LA, you were literally <laughs> my first black friend. You know that, right? Oh. I came out here. I'm like, because there, there, there's a feeling. Again, when you walk in a room and no matter where you're at, you are the only black guy there. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. looks like the oh, oh, okay. <laughs> He's one of the good ones. I'm like, motherfucker. But uh, <laughs> like I remember like walking over to like a, a mutual friend Xander's house, and it was like a weight off my shoulders. Like, oh, okay, thank God. Somebody who also understands what it is to a very personal, especially because you're also an actor as well, man. And say, so, like, dude, one, first of all, you are black. Second of all, you got the good prince hair. I want you to accept that. <laughs> third of all, you're black, Mark. You sound black. That's what black sounds like. Except, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, black sounds like you, Bill. Black sounds yeah. like Nella. Black sounds yeah. like AJ. Yeah. Black sounds like Anaris. Right. We are all black, and this is our voice, and there's no one sound. Yeah, we're we're black, black, we're so, yeah, we no longer have to be so desperate for a job that we're like, so I need the job and you need me now to talk like this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's because I, I mean, I'm just speaking this out to other actors because if you're just starting out or you're already working, you're allowed. And, and I guess we were always allowed, but we didn't feel like it. That's a whole other conversation of permission. Yeah. You're allowed to say this doesn't ring true, or I would actually say it like this, and this is my background, or my family's from Mississippi, or you know, you can pull from your own experience. And and you know, going back to that where Disney even asked me, there was a character I did, and they're like, Is that sounding like someone in your family? <laughs> they were just like, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't a caricature, and you're just like, Yeah, it's 
It's straight up, yeah. But it was because they're 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 trying to be careful in a way, but it's 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 a difficult navigation. So please speak up and tell them your story. You know, I was a foster kid. I'm adopted. I met my biological dad. You know, I'm from um, Africa and I was tra I was trained here. Elocution and poetry are my things. Please make yourself a person to the casting directors and your directors. Let them know who you are. Don't be like, I'm so beholden and thankful for the job. I'm a worker bee. Mm -hmm. Because right now you're a king. You're a queen. You are mm -hmm. someone redefining possible for those that come after us. So please, yeah. please speak up and own your story and your voice. Thank you so well much said. for saying that. That was very well said. And before we get into the fan questions, because we got about nine questions to get through. I think they're going to be pretty quick, actually. They're not very extensive. Um, I wish more people realize that blackness is not just the African-American or It's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're literally everywhere. Everywhere. Diaspora, yeah, is huge. And every continent. Mm -hmm. And it's it means something just... different in other places, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's not just... African American urban, you know, literally everywhere. Yeah. So I I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a conversation I wish more casting people needed to have. Yeah. Um. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're gonna go into some fan questions because we got about nine of them. Okay. Um. This one is from Alex Weitzman. Too much awesome hey. panel. <laughs> we love Alex. Uh. Here's a question for the whole group. What's your favorite ridiculous character spec you've gotten that you can recall? <laughs> Who would like to go first? And I'll just go around and. I, oh, that's gonna take me a second. I don't remember. I'm, my memory is horrible. Um, I'm Bill. I, <laughs> I'm I got a breakdown asking for a sound alike for a Mela character, but I didn't book it. I didn't sound. No enough. way. <laughs> what? Oh my God. That's insane. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. You know what? Though? That's, that's a bucket list moment right there. When, like, when you're so good, you can't match yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I had something similar. Um, it was an audition where it, where the, it was one of OG's characters, and I'm like, well, you could just hire OG. You know, he's right they, did. they did. They <laughs> did. Cool. Yeah, awesome. you just just go to him and be like, "Yo, are you busy? Do you want to come in?" Right over there. I remember that, Cedric. I remember that, Cedric. Remember that. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to think of like favorite weird spec because we get a lot of stuff and you kind of forget what weird is because you know, yeah. yeah, you just kind of have to go with it. You it's know? all weird. <laughs> I, I I think one weird thing is when they try to mix a bunch of countries for one person, when they say, speak, um, we want a little bit of Irish, French, Jamaican, and uh, Creole in there. And I'm like, they, you know, I had one where they speak, they, they, they put all these languages. I'm like, ah, who... I don't know how to do that. And, um, do you have I'm a like, specific person in mind? Yeah. Is it yeah. Up? <laughs> or whoever can pull off that French, Irish, Jamaican... <laughs> I don't know, but uh, yeah. That's like, if you have a mixed character, that's fine, but they don't have to have a mix of accents. It don't work yeah. that way. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. It's like, where, where are they physically from that they spend all of their time and therefore would have that accent? That's it. Yeah. And then it's the like character you. character breakdown says they own a teleporter and they live in all four <laughs> places simultaneously. <laughs> yeah. Come on, we're all used to code switching. Let's absolutely. One hundred percent. I love the all ones right. we get this like six pages long of a description, and then like the sides are like one line. Got an old scream. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> grenade. I'm like. I didn't need to know he knew Jesus at 12. Come on, man. <laughs> well, uh, Bill, that's when you like, for each word, you have the subtext in your head of those things you just read. Yeah. So each, each word is uh, a different in inclination of something that you read in the breakdown. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We got another question. This is from Ariella. Questions. Anyone relate to one of your roles? I was actually going to ask a similar question to this. Um, but it seems like someone got it, so we'll give them that question. If so, did you put your full emotions or background into X role slash character? Who would like to go first? I mean, speaking for myself, I think there's 
but you have to find something in, in each of the characters, mm -hmm. I think. Just something. It doesn't have to be super deep. You don't have to completely relate with your situation, but, you know, always kind of seeing some sort of similarity between what they're going through and what you're going through, I think just makes your read sound more authentic. So in every single one of my characters, I have that. Um, I, I can't, I can, I, I think I relate to Takamichi a lot because of, of, of what Takamichi is trying to do and that he's, you know, trying to just better himself and, and everything like that. But in, in general though, I feel like every single character I've played has a bit of me in them. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. It's very important. Agreed. And that's yeah. what makes you irreplaceable. Anyone else? Hey. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Hi, Ariella. Um, for me, I think definitely Isaac. We were recording the latest seasons right around when BLM was happening and, um, you know, all these shootings by police <laughs> were happening to various you know, innocent civilians. And, um, yeah, and I think I was just so... Isaac has lines like, you don't think I'm human, uh, that he says to these white mm. people who are trying to basically take his life. And so much of what was, I was going on personally, you know, I had been attacked by um, a group of white kids at one point who threw stuff at me and called me an effing N-word. And, you know, I was able to just draw upon all of that at a time when it seemed like we were all under attack. We were all feeling very marginalized, um, we're disenfranchised and generally just feeling very oppressed, you know, and not just in this continent, but happening around the world. And so... Uh, so many of the di so much of the dialogue that Isaac had really reflected what I was personally feeling. So it was just, yeah, and not just myself, but all my friends of color, you know. And um, and then you know you want to also add the fact that Isaac is Sufi and you know Muslim and LGBTQ coded. You're seeing all these you know historically marginalized aspects coming to the forefront through this character. And, um, you know, and, and I was just like, oh, it was an emotional time because literally what we were going on, what was going on within our society was what Isaac was going through hundreds of years ago. And I think the pain also that I felt that not so much had changed over four or five hundred years, you know, and yes, we've, we've made enormous strides, do not get me wrong, but you also realize that we have so much further to go. And the fact that so much of what I was saying, you know, as Isaac was exactly what was going on in society today it was just it was heartbreaking but it was important so yeah yeah that's the power yeah. subtext mm -hmm. wow. that in. one but of the I most mean, powerful characters in that show man so thank you for that performance yeah. thank you that's, yeah. would anyone else like to answer ariella's question I saw, ahead, Bill. I saw mark so you're gonna have to battle it out sorry go for it, Bill. no mark for it go ahead no, go Don't wrestle I, for it I said what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, mine, um, I'll be honest with you, it's uh, dad characters. I'm a very strong kind of paternal kind of figure. Like uh, I want to be dad one day, but at the same time, like I very much like to like adopt, you know, people like that. Like it's like, oh, yeah. So like, I be real with you. Uh, characters like uh, Kiosuke Hori, Hori Mia, and uh, Blood and Faraway Paladin, who are these down of dad characters. I will be straight up, which you can ask the engineer, I will straight up cry in those sessions and like scenes like that, because that's something very important to me, especially from like people like uh, my own father, a uh, great guy. He, um, my dad has cancer and he uh, was lieutenant commander of the Navy, got a master's in business. And even while having cancers and his meloma, uh, still went to work, take care of my mom who has MS to make sure she was okay, didn't even care about his own well-being. He's the kind of guy you could hit with a car. He'd apologize for hurting your car. So, like, that's the kind of, like, person he is. It's kind of like, rubbed off on me to have that kind of good, caring soul to care about everyone else outside of yourself first and make sure that gets passed down forward. And um, playing characters like that means the world to me. I see a joke, like, anime dad, but, like, it really does mean the world to me because that's, like, of what I grew up with and that was inspired me to live. So, um, anytime I can play a dad is actually what is, is the biggest thing for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Mark, yeah. did you want to go since you had your hand up? Yeah. So um, Yota Narukami in The Day I Became a God was probably the first time in 15 years that I was 100% into a character. And by that, I, I don't mean to say that I didn't try hard with other characters. It was that leaving the booth, I had to reset my brain because there was mm -hmm. so much similar to us. You know, he had at one time ambitions of playing basketball. So did I, you know, he's dealing with uh, uh, someone he cares about who is, I don't want to spoil the show, but someone he cares about is dealing with uh, uh, congenitive illness, 
um, that's likely terminal. And that was, you know, I went through that with my stepmother. Um, and the biggest thing was that um, I had to record a very emotional episode dealing with loss the weekend after uh, a friend and, and cherished member of the VO community, uh, Brad Venable, passed away. It was my very first session after getting that news. And like, I've never done method acting, but I it was 100% heartbreaking to have to do that that weekend. But I had to do it that weekend. Um, and so it, it that whole show from start to finish felt the most me of any character I've ever played, hands down. Like AJ said, we always try to put a little bit of us into everything that we do, but that was the one that was just like all me all the time. So that was that was hard to say goodbye to, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You guys have some heavy stories. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. I guess we're moving on. Did anyone else want to go before I do that? I'm scared, too. <laughs> but you're talking thing. After them two brothers told them story, I'm like, oh, that's a, mm, okay. Hey, everything counts. Everything counts. I, you know, only the characters I identify with, they just silly and conceited and like, you know, looking at it. And all that kind of, I mean, because that's what I did growing up and speaking of like trying to fit in with people, you know, it's like um, just, um, you know, um, and seeing my grandfather and the definition of cool and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, so I would I would practice that as a kid, um, and then um, and and I'll just never forget a session where, you know, filled session with people, and I was just so, I was just feeling my, I was just so in the character, and the, and I hate to say because y'all had these serious stories, but my character was looking at himself in the mirror and like fixing his hair, and and uh, you know. They they said cut or whatever, but I didn't cut. I kept going, and I, was, <laughs> and I was and I went on for like at least three minutes, and and the whole production they just sat back and watched me, and I was because that's what I do. So I was just like, oh yeah, look mm. at me, you know, and I was just on it, and I and then I broke out of that spell, and I was like, oh, and I was like, whoa, well, I was like, it just felt weird because I'm like, well, that's kind of what I do at home when I'm. You know, when I'm by myself, I'm saying it's like you got it, but it's like I just felt it with that character because these people they knew me, so they kind of wrote the character kind of like me a little bit. So, yeah, so, so I was just feeling all the stuff, you know. But You're it was, living it. Yeah, yeah, it was, that was, it was fun. I I love when I when I can feel a character like that, especially like AJ, like you said, when you bring pieces of your character into you and in, mm -hmm. into them, like pieces of yourself into the character. When it matches like that, that's like that's Hollywood magic. You know okay. what I mean? When you can, you know, and especially when you're I, I rarely watch my stuff, but but when you're reading it and you can feel a part of you in that character, you feel it when you're you're talking. Like it's uh -huh. it's I don't know, it's uh, it, it's just magical. It's it's pretty um it's really cool. It's really cool. I you know, yeah, I love getting into it. But yeah, but yeah, that's this all. There's actually, oh, I feel like this happens. I don't, I, again, I don't have as much experience as a lot of people here, but I, I, there, there's times when I've auditioned for characters where I've been like, I, if I don't get this, it's not because, you know, of anything I didn't read right or whatever. Like, this is me. This is what I have mm -hmm. to offer. If you don't cast me, it is what it is, but yeah. <laughs> you just want yeah. something else. But like, there's sometimes, and, and that's hard, especially as someone new where I want to, I want to do everything perfect. And I'm like, what does casting want and blah, blah, blah. But this, th there was one where I read recently, I was like, I did one take and I was like, I don't know what else. I, I this is it. <laughs> Here you go. Here you go. And if you don't pick it, you don't pick it. But. And those matter because casting directors are working on so many projects each year that if that if and they'll push for you, you don't know behind the scenes. But if the mm -hmm. client doesn't call for you, that casting director remembers that read. Mm -hmm. I've had two yeah. or three major jobs that have come to me. 18 months and eight years after the fact where they're like, Oh my gosh, I loved hearing you in this particular thing. And I instantly knew you were right for. And wow. so when you give them that read and yeah. we've all had that where we're like, man, I'm perfect. And you don't book it. You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> With that feeling happened, you booked something. That's why you got that yeah. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Else for you. yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. said. Well said. Sure. We're going to go and pick up another question. This is for Anaris from David. 
Are you excited to voice Mirko for the sixth season of My Hero Academia? <laughs> I am. Because and I neither am. can I. <laughs> <laughs> I've read the manga, so I know what's coming up, so I'm psyched. You're what psyched? season are we on now? Five or, or is six coming up? Five. We're on five? Six. Five. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Right. We I got that glow. question. This is from Canadian Bard. I have a question for everyone across all the characters you voice. Which quote or moment is your favorite mm. or most memorable to you? Now, I I have my memories of Civ at this point because I'm getting older, but some of you may remember some things. So let's let's talk about it. Who remembers a quote from a character that is very memorable or your favorite that you've ever said? One of the first major characters I ever played was in a show called Clay Kids. And that show aired in 19 countries around the world, but not the United States. So no one has seen it here okay. anyway. But I played a character named Motor and I actually was a recast from the pilot. So I was the only person recast out of the whole pilot cast. And they completely changed the character to match me because of one episode where he got just a little angry but I made him very angry. <laughs> and so they started writing more meltdowns for the character. And my favorite was he gets in a fight with another character named Naomi. And the line was, Naomi's butt is as fat as her head. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why that one always stuck with me, but it has always stuck with me. And so that one just up here all the time. Love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Fantastic. I have no notes. Mella, you have one? Yeah, I was an incendiary, incendi like a guest star for um, Avengers Assemble Black Panther's Quest was the last season of that series, but also the last thing that Stan Lee had written on for Marvel. And there was a character named Princess Xanda. And in the 70s, in the graphic novel, she was sort of this camp you know, woman, and she hid out at the KCF and she didn't want to be seen. She worked at the KCF instead of the KFC. So it was I just like, that's and I was like, I was like, wait, what? really <laughs> kind of made her a joke because she, she lost out to Storm, say. But in the new reiteration for this guest star, the thing about Princess Zanda is she is a shapeshifter. And she's this beautiful black woman and her superpower, she can shape shift so seamlessly into the other superheroes that they that that's how she infiltrates the Avengers. And so she's a villain, but let's look at the power of this beautiful black woman who can be all things. Hey. But because she wasn't recognized, she ends up being considered a villain because she has to shape shift all the time. So somebody figured out a way to use that. And it happens to be the shadow syndicate, but she's up against black Panther and the, and the quote, even in, he's like, why are you doing this? She's like, I'm as great a warrior as you black Panther. I'm not a princess. And, you know, and it's like, and then he tries to save her and she doesn't want the help. And then um, Stan has her shape shift as Atlantis is falling into a sparrow. Um, and so just yeah. his last thing he writes about this beautiful black woman, and, and it applies to a lot of us, but just that concept of the greatness in her, but because she was not recognized as a hero, because she was not included in the conversation, this power, this great power was not used for good. Uh -huh. And that he, what a beautiful thing that this man and, and the writers and Jeffrey, who was working on it as well, just to, to have a nod to the power of a marginalized people. You know, we all think we're the hero in someone's story, but we're the villain in someone else's, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so I, I really appreciate the humanity of her saying, I was as great as you, but she never got the chance to be recognized or included in the conversation. And it's why it's so important to have us all be included because, you know, power unrecognized becomes power what? Exploding somewhere else. You know, it needs to be included. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what Mela said. I mean, that beautifully said. And one of my favorite quotes in Castlevania wasn't by me, but it was by uh, Lance Reddick, who plays the captain. And he goes, if you 
don't tell your own story, you become part of someone else's. Mm. Oh, wow. And it just echoes this African um, proverb, which goes, uh, until the lion tells a story, the tale of the hunt will always be told by the hunter. And wow. I'm like, that is so true. You look at African history and it's always been told from one side. It paints us as savages and barbaric and underdeveloped. And I didn't even know much about my own history. And it's really inspired me to go back and look at our heroes and realize that history has been rewritten to suit the victor, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is not really an accurate portrayal of what happened. And and so it in, in, the, in Castlevania, it inspired um, Isaac to start living a new life and go on his own mission and do things for himself rather than do things for, you know, vengeance for the people or for Dracula. And it, for me as well, I took that as a sort of sign to be like, okay, Ade, you need to actually start living your own life and, you know, tell your own stories and, and do what matters most. And, and it culminated in, you know, I think Isaac's last line. And I find it so appropriate that we're all doing signings for the Loveland Foundation, which benefits um, African-American women and girls. And, you know, his last line is spoiler, but he goes, I'm going to live. And, and I just saw that as he's going to live fully, you know, fully for himself and just reach his fullest potential. And it was such a beautiful moment for me and, and you know, for so many other people as well. Hmm. That's awesome. That's Man. wonderful. I got some dope stories, some, some dope insight. This is really cool listening to you guys. All right, so let's go on to the next question. This is from Abdullah. Question, out of all the roles you've done, what would you say was the hardest and why? Ooh. Ooh. Hardest role. Ooh. Um, um, hardest role for me was probably Leon in Pokemon Masters because Leon has had, like, he has four voice actors as of now. Um, at the time, it was uh, two. Um, and for this one, they wanted him to do a British accent. Um, and I'm not the best at accents, still working on it. Um, so I had to, um, throughout the whole session, I was in my head trying to get this accent right. I practiced with my friend who was British and I got a little bit of insight on the accent. And uh, yeah, like I really, he's the champion of the Galar region. So I really wanted him to like have this authority and confidence and I couldn't, do that if I was thinking about the accent, but I ended up doing it. And uh, some people like it, some people don't, but you know, I still put my heart into it and became a champion like Leon. See, I yeah. like it, Cedric. Yes, Cedric. <laughs> is a champion. That's right. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Did anyone else want to answer that? I've got two. Oh boy. Oh, I One. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank Ninjum for saving my black ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because certain people, Funimation, like to record multiple levels at once, so when you are doing nothing but screaming and speaking in your absolute most disgusting voice possible, for Jack the Drought, I wanted to die some days. But I don't know. <laughs> 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 I was like, you're hey, gonna guys. I'm like, no. Because I was screaming on top of my lungs, taking on an elephant the size of Kansas. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Another actually, uh, it wasn't, it was fun, more hard, but the hard part was actually convincing the studio to let me do it. And uh, it was a show called Kuroko's Basketball. Mm. And mm. they wanted to book me for a, uh, a literal black man. I say black man, this dude was literally from Senegal. So I'm like, dope. So uh, I ain't gonna lie, I uh, told him, like the casting director is like, ah, uh, I said the accents and dialects uh, pretty extensively in college. Uh, can you give me an accent? They're like, well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like, I don't mean to brag, but uh, I'm black. Uh, so my family's from Zaire. Uh, my mom's black Cherokee. Uh, I can definitely do this if you would like. So we're recording it. And they're like, one of them's like, just make him sound black. I'm like, first of all, I hate you. Second of all, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we do, it was like, all right, can, can we give it a shot? Because I had two directors. And uh, by the time the second director came in, uh, his name was Jalen Cassell, who's like one of like Jaylen. the two black directors out there. Jaylen. So respected, I do love that kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jalen's like, yeah, let me hear it. So I did. And he was like, no, that's it. That's what we're doing this entire time. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, yo, let's go. So I'm happy to say uh, hey, they kept it. And Lauren is on Netflix right now. Watch Critical's Basketball. You can hear me as Papa. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Let's get right there. 
That's a good um, show. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Great uh, show. Classic. Uh, I, Zeno as the lead, breaking barriers. Yeah, Zeno, yeah. Um, Zeno I smoking. am doing a, a character uh, right now that's that was it, it's it's the main character of 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 a prelay show that you know. Uh, I can't really announce yet, but it, the character is very high strong and it's a big deal. And, and I'm still so early in my career. It, the reason why it's hard not is, isn't necessarily because of the character, but because I need to, I, I'm still trying to battle with myself sometimes in sessions where it's like, I'm enough. I like, I'm not going to be kicked off. I'm not like I'm here for a reason because I don't have an acting background and everything like that. So I have this, like, it, do I even belong here type thing? Uh, and I'm still trying to, battle with that so i think that's my biggest struggle right now and has been up until this point is just believing that like i'm here for a reason i'm here to they cast me because i they want me <laughs> so let me not sabotage myself in this session um so that's that's mine uh totally feel that too aj the yeah. imposter syndrome oh yeah um, yeah all mean, absolutely know that aj <laughs> most of theatrical training is teaching you to uncensor yourself like until we're seven, we think we can be anything. And then when we're eight, yeah. something happens, your friends, your teachers, they tell you who you are, who you can't be. And so you've had a such a, an incredible and exquisite experience of life of several families and, and having to believe in yourself and ground yourself and find your like muladhara and like that root uh, of, your, of your own. And that what you are worrying about, like maybe that you think, well, I haven't had a lot of training. Mm -hmm. You're already so present. It's what makes you an actor that a casting director wants to um, cast because you you are emotionally intelligent. You've had to navigate feelings of abandonment and 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 self sacrifice as well as self worth. Mm -hmm. And those tools are actually those of us that do have some acting training. They're just basically teaching us to mm -hmm. harness and to recognize the vulnerability and the magic in the cracks. And you do that naturally. So Thank let me you, just speak Lauren. into you for a moment that that you are already doing what we had to remember how to redo. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We have a question from Dan. What's your process for creating a unique voice character based on role specs? <laughs> I um <clears throat> I don't have a process. I'm like I said, you know, I'm I'm really big on improv and so 90% of the time, even probably even 95% of the time, I'm looking at the specs and as I'm reading, it's just in my head. And so I go with the first thing that comes out. The only time that that's not true is if uh sometimes in dubbing they they really want you to match the root language. So there've been times when I've had to study the original actor, whether that's in anime or live action dubbing. I've, I've done some some Spanish dubs. I've done a, a German dub. So I've had to dub a, a few different languages. And so in those instances, you do kind of follow what they did. And so that becomes more of a character study and less about creating the voice. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm the worst example of a process you'll ever find because I just <laughs> go for it. So <laughs> natural, baby. Shoot. I make it personal. Mm -hmm. And I was it's like, oh, what does the side say? They're a maniacal doctor. Da -da 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 -da. I'm like, cool. So I'm like, chocolate is like, cool. All right. Right now, I'm a maniacal doctor. I find joy in giving people pain. List goes on. And after that, I'm like, cool. And I read, I am in 12 foot tall, sorry, 27 foot tall elephant man. Bet. You are now with dad who hasn't been, who's off work six months out of the year. His daughter hates him. Gives him access to the face. Kills Kahori. Bet. So they're not making a voice at all. It's like, this is me in the situation right now. And then I just have fun. That's the biggest part, having fun. We forget that, especially for auditions. Adeta? Yeah, so I, I read the sides. I read the spec. And then I... I um, actually go to my four-year-old nephew and I try different voices on him. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Sometimes he likes oh, them, man. sometimes he hates them, but kids are brutally honest. I'm like, okay, that's all <laughs> So that's he's awesome. like my voice coach in a way. Um, <laughs> and, and then something else I find, you know, because uh, going back to the, uh, to the question before, uh, what's a huge challenge for I think all of us voice actors is keeping our stamina and keeping our voices. 
And, you know, I've done a lot of video games where it's extremely difficult to sort of keep consistent and keep your voice over four or five hour sessions. And what's really helped me is I, I, run, I enrolled in singing lessons and I figure out, you know, where my voice it resonates for different characters, how I can sustain that sound for hours on end, breathing, making sure that I have enough stamina to breathe through a line. So singing has really, really helped me become mm. a better, better voiceover actor. For those of you who are interested in that, but that's that's something that's helped me. Mm. Okay. I'll see you at karaoke. I'll see you at karaoke. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very insightful answer. I really like uh, mentioning singing because mm. it, it's definitely helped me, and it's helped a lot of other actors too because you're playing what your resonance is in that way. All right. So moving on to the next question. Um, we're going to go and give um, priority to people that have not had their questions answered yet. This one's from Twitter. Since black voice actors used to be pigeonholed into certain roles, but that is quickly shifting, what do you think can be done to encourage casting directors to use black voices in even more dynamic and varied ways? That was something I was going to have in my whole list of questions, but it seems like someone got it for me. Who would like to go first? Mm. So what's I'm a, sorry. The can question. you repeat that? Can you, yeah. Yeah. AJ and I need you to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> Since black voice actors, oh, there it is. They can hold into certain roles, but that is quickly shifting. What do you think can be done to encourage casting directors to use black voices in even more dynamic and varied ways? Um, I got. Hi, Bill. I got a little something. Uh, this is a true life story. Uh, started early, kind of like 2020. Um, a lot of stuff happens where a lot of the community kind of realized, wow, if you're doing an anime or show on a black story, but you didn't hire one black actor. All right, that's cool. And uh, it was upsetting. So uh, this is just something personally for me that I found work. I encourage y'all to do it as well. I just straight up emailed and started talking to the actual casting directors. Hey, I'd like to oh. talk to you about this issue. and. It was more of an educational process because a lot of them, unfortunately, uh, didn't realize that um, this is what black sounds like. So they literally, and I say literally, did not know that we could sound like them, unfortunately. So it was more of an educational process. And uh, I granted, um, I'll be real with you, on a personal level, uh, it's incredibly upsetting. And I was very upset about it, still am, have every right to be. But I've come to find that it's, it's better to try and educate them in that or else, um, put bluntly, if I come at them in anger with the issue, I have to have the right to be, but I choose not to. I only prove their own racist thoughts right, that we are nothing but angry people. So it's a terrible thing, but at the same time, I find it the best way to just educate them, befriend them, and help them become truly allies in that there. And over the time, the years I've seen... <clears throat> A lot of opportunities open up for them now. They have that new data, new mindset shifting, and that can be very infectious. Where you get one, it's actually spreads to two more, and that spreads more with the more data out there. And that's how you really kind of spread that love to that. And that's I could talk for hours about that, but y'all, y'all say y'all say your piece, do you? Mm. Well, yeah, so like, Melo. Oh, I was going to say that I think it's important to to have a skill set, a process, understand who you are and bringing your authenticity, like the undeniable art of specificity in the acting is important. So who you're talking to, who you are, just like what Bill said, if he's the villain, then your villain loves the same things you do. There's a humanity in your characters. But number two, the casting directors work for writers and show creators, mm -hmm. and they're kind of a middleman. And so, you know, we, we can help the casting directors by by using our voices online and, and and really reaching out to show creators and doing like what Bill did and said, we'd like to be part of it. But on the other side, everyone on this call, we should be continuing to mentor um, uh, young actors with free workshops and, and, yeah. and giving them a safe place to ask questions so they know what's appropriate because it's such a mystery that when they get there, they, they're so glad to, and I've been here, you're so glad for the job. You don't know what you're allowed to ask or to say no to. And, yeah. and I think it's extremely important. My hashtag on my Twitter is we rise together, that yeah. we need to mentor young actors. We need to make ourselves available. You can email me at themelolee at gmail.com. Hey. Um, for other people, you can find them on social media, ask questions, um, get free reports, get free 
panels like this because casting directors will come and reach out to Cedric or to Bill or to myself or anyone on here. Do you know anybody that can? Yeah. And that's, that's an opportunity. If we don't have other people to recommend to them, we've missed the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to have 10 to 20 people that we brought up that we can go, yeah, here you go. (laughs) Right. And so that we, we can get rid of that scarcity mindset that there's only so many jobs and know that if there's 55,000 projects, there's millions of characters for us to play. And I don't want to be in there alone. So let's go ahead and, and lift other people up and start training them and telling our stories. That's why it was so important. AJ was like, I don't know if my story is so important because it's a, it's very important. People need to see themselves in the successes of their their icons. So we have to be vulnerable. We have to be uncomfortable. We have to tell our story. And then we need to to raise other young actors and not just young in age. Um, right now we have a, an exploration of not just diversity in, in culture, but in age and, um, and size and shape. And if you're 60 and you've always dreamed of being a voice actor, there's time for you. Like let's mm-hmm. teach you yeah. to, to in- embrace your story. And there's room, for you. there's room for you. There's room for you. There's room for you. There's room for you. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So much. OG, you wanted to, um, I just want to say something. Um, I, I cast, for some for some things I I um you know for a um a big time advertising this advertising agency I I um I'm heading of, of their VO department and it's like also to piggyback on what you guys are saying but also it's like I tapped into what Mark was saying it's like um having um uh having the casting person what I love is uh, casting somebody and when they come in um and we're and we're and I have the clients there and we're working and you guys are in the booth doing your thing. And it's like, um, but having, being able to do other things and showing them that how you can do other mm-hmm. things, they're like, oh my God, did you, they could do that. Oh my God. And they could do a British accent. Oh my God. And, they could do that. Oh my God. and they're actually yes. seeing the black person in front of them yeah. do all this. It blows the, I, I tell you, it blows their mind. And, <laughs> and nine times out of 10, they're like, they bring them back for some other character that, you know, that they usually would not have gotten, you know, we, we, we would not get cast for so right. and, and then on the casting side too with the casting person it's like for me i'm like oh you made me look like a superstar so you know but but i know that 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 is one way is um you know when we get the opportunities and they go okay we need a voice for this or can or can you try you know this or that you know really go for it really show them your range that's just when you show them the range and they're like oh my god oh wow okay 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 mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, yeah. AJ? Uh, real quick, uh, this what I'll say. I can't really speak on the casting side of things, but the first thing I did when I joined my, my, my first like big agency, my first national agency before CSD was I talked to the president of, of, of the agency. And I was like, I, I know why I'm here. Right. I know that like, cause I was brought on at the time of Black Lives Matter thing. I was like, I know you guys need people that like, that are like me. And I'm more than happy to read for all the stuff, all the black things are going to send me. But what I'm not going to accept is not getting other things, please. And I was very respectful about it. I was like, give me everything. And if I'm not getting everything, I will bring it up to you. Um, and if, if that's not something that we can agree on, I understand. And I will be more than happy to go to a different agency that will take the time to listen to me and, and give me that attention. But I would appreciate if you please do me the due diligence. Like I'm going to give you the due diligence of reading on all the black sides that you now have for all the people like, wow, we, we support Black Lives Matter. I'm going to read for all that. But if, you know, if you can have me read for Miles Morales, I want to read for Peter Parker. There's, there's, you know, that sort of thing. And that'll give, you know, because sometimes agents are told like, oh, we only want your top five or that you think can do this or your top 10. It's like, you know, you don't have to include me every single time. I know I'm new, but like maybe put a person of color or a couple person of color in that top five. It, it, you know, it's, it, everybody can do their job. It's not really just the casting director, just the writer, just the showrunner. Everybody needs to do their job including our agents so don't be afraid if you're ever in a situation where where you know you're new to an agency it is a partnership no matter how new you are whether you're fred tattishore or you're me you 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 belong there so you should have that conversation it's often yeah that is I, I, absolutely correct mark i want to piggyback on that really heavily because what i was thinking about through this whole thing is that 
the biggest thing that's missing from in, in terms of making diversity actually diverse is trust. You know, we need casting directors and directors to trust that everyone in their talent pool is as capable as everyone else of playing the characters. It's got to be more than just send them the, the black characters. It has to be more than that because we cannot show you what we can do if we don't have those opportunities. So exactly like AJ was saying, you know, we, we're, we're hoping that casting directors will take that take that leap of faith and trust that the people who they are sending all the gangsters to read can also play the protagonist, can also play the sassy best friend, can also play the father of three. You know, we need those opportunities to show you that we can do what you think we can't do. Um, so we're going to move forward. And uh, since we are a little over time, I want to go and jump to... Um, two really important questions. These are from Amina. And this is a question for Adeta Kumbo. There is a genesis of continental African accents coming to the forefront in US animated productions. Do you see this voice trend continuing? And how do you get in front of those decision makers? That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely starting to be a voice trend, and, and I'm thankful for that because it allows us also not just to be the generic accent, the African accent, which has happened so many times. Like, just do an African accent. I'm like, there's so many countries yes. in Africa, and within each country, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there's like dozens of different tribes. So, um, you know, so what I've noticed though is I've had a lot of people on Twitter and social media start actually writing or tweeting certain creators and being like, well, what about this? What about this? Enforcing them and writers and forcing them to see or to put in different characters or different voices from different countries or different regions. So it's not just a generic, you know, right now, what I'm seeing is a lot of South African and a lot of Nigerian, but you know, there's what about Sierra Leone, what about Liberia, what about Congo, what about, you know, so I think it's important for us as and, and everyone out there who's a viewer, who's a consumer ultimately, to also tell us, tell um, Netflix and whichever VOD platform that's out there that you want to see yourselves represented. And and thankfully we're starting to see more of that, but we can go so much further. So mm. that's the question. <laughs> and if, if I can, just with a little bit, you know, there was there was a time where for certain studios I was the guy they brought in to play kids and teenagers from African villages. And we never saw specificity. Not mm. once. I, I would go in you know, a, a few days before the session, I'd email them and say, hey, where is this person from? And they'd be like, Africa. And I was like, okay, but like, where are they from? Because those yeah. those accents are different. Yeah. And it's very, uh, it's very comforting to see that there's actually more care to the approach now to try and figure out, okay, where is this person from? What culture are we representing in this story? It's not just throw in a generic West African dialect. It's, yeah. there's an actual place that this person is from and a culture that they're representing. And, and I have seen some more sides go out with more specificity and that is yeah. key mm -hmm. in these kinds of things. So, yeah. My man. Okay, well, thank you for that answer. That was wonderful. And um, I think we are people able to go over time in this sure. panel. Are you guys cool with space staying a little past 11? I'm oh, sorry, 12 to answer some more questions. Is that okay? All Let's right. go. Beautiful. So we're going to take a couple more questions. This one's from Revamped Roses. Were there any cartoon slash anime characters you identified with growing up? Also, hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, Cedric? Um, for me, it was SpongeBob because he represented um, being a kid at heart. He represented like being loud and funny and innocent and growing up. I wanted to be the center of attention because um, I was a nerd, but like, and I used comedy to get attention from people. I was a class clown as well, like AJ. And um, SpongeBob was a character that I identified with. And so um, I became a little annoying, but... <laughs> Um, and people actually gave me the nickname SpongeBob. That character meant so much to me. Um, he's just, he's a very, he's a timeless character. He's this generation's Bugs Bunny and, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse. He's going to be around forever. And I'm glad that, he, that he's here because 
he subconsciously inspired me to get into voice acting, to perform, and to let my imagination go wild. It's a great answer. Anyone else? I would love to answer that question. As an African, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I was like, oh yeah, I'm Superman, I'm Batman, I'm you know, Spider-Man. From those are the ones I identified with. But the issue was a lot of the ones that looked like me were like they had like the bones in the noses and the, you know, they're wearing the loincloths. And, and I was like, that's not my heritage, that's not my history, that's not my background. And so it was that's honestly what inspired me to start writing and directing and producing as I got older, because you know, I, when I saw my, I was playing with my nephew one day and he was playing with the same action figures I was playing with 30 something years ago. And I was like, okay, this is history repeating itself. You're a child of color, this ain't gonna happen. And so I started developing stories as well and, and animated stories and uh, graphic novels and for kids and also for people who are getting older just so they can fully see themselves represented in a positive, robust, interesting way. You know, and they can also be like, okay, you know, thankfully Black Panther's happening, amazing. But there are so many other characters that we can also portray. So, yeah. John Stewart. John Stewart. There My we go. man. John Stewart was a uh, big thing for me. One, uh, voiced by a black man. And two, uh, this dude, I'll be honest with you, as a black man growing up, yo, this dude was there, he had a white name. I'll be honest with you. My name is Bill. So I'm going to start right there. And uh, second off, this dude's power literally is his will unbreakable and to me as a black man society that means so much to me comic wise the first thing he does is take out a racist politician you can look that up so i'm like yo let's go and um seeing that grow up has always been kind of like really really inspiring to me because that, just, that means a lot. It means a lot to never get up, to actually be able to do whatever I can possibly can and be unbreakable. And that is awesome to me. And the ring only goes to you when you have that power already on the inside. So that is awesome to me. So, uh, yep. There it is. Long story short, John Stewart. There's my booth, by the way. There's my microphone. <laughs> how, how, can I, how can I forget? Like, both Bill and at a, I can't pronounce his name. I'm sorry. At a, full chest. Bill Kumbo? Yeah, Ed, Ed did Kumo, Gumbo. Uh, they mentioned superheroes that inspired them. Um, I forgot to mention Miles Morales, duh. Oh, like, oh yeah, no. I mean, Spider-Man, like, you know, Jamie Foxx said it in in No Way Home. He's like, I kind of imagine uh, Spider-Man. That's my black, boy. You know? and, uh, and, like, you know, logically, you know, when you see him, like, he's doing all these acrobatics. He's, like, in New York. He's saving people. You know, you would think he was black, and then he finally made a black Spider-Man who looks like us. And like, mm -hmm. you know, he's uh That's... he's black and Latino, so he represents two cultures, and he's doing all this cool stuff and into the Spider-Verse really like allowed Miles Morales to get his time to shine. And we're gonna eventually get a live action Miles Morales. And that's just so beautiful to see that. Like, to be sure. he, he's <laughs> even stronger than Peter Parker, he has more powers, and like yeah, I that, that I, inspired me, Miles. I, I was going to say, for me, it was Peter Parker when I was growing up because there was no black Spider-Man. Yeah. And Spider-Man was one of the few superheroes whose power was his intellect. Yeah. Mm. You know, he did have amazing strength and amazing reactions, but he invented so many gadgets. You know, traditionally, his web shooters, he invented those. He invented the material that they shoot. He invented, you know, cars and drones and all kinds of incredible things, you know. Um and growing up for me, I, you know, I was I was a nerd. You know, I wanted to be a weatherman when I was a kid. Like that was what I wanted to do. So he was my superhero. And I was I was late on the miles train because it happened when I sort of stopped reading comics. Um, but as a grown man, watching into the Spider Verse made me cry because it, it was just thinking about all the kids like me who now had a Spider Man who looked like them, and that how important that is kind of like Ade was saying to, to have a superhero who looks like you is extremely important because it means that you are just as capable of the amazing and awesome things as everybody else. Yeah. And it's that was it. something that missed from my childhood, but it was, it was, it, it moved me incredibly to see such a, a, a heartfelt representation of what is unequivocally uh, unequivocally a spider-man who is also 
black who is also latino like it's so important to have that representation in my favorite superhero it was it was just phenomenal yeah yeah and just and i'm gonna add a little something before we get to our next question that is the demographic of brooklyn now that's just how it is there's a lot of people in brooklyn that have that exact same background that he has that's just the actual demographic over time it completely changed so miles is not just an accurate representation of both communities black and latino he definitely is but he also more accurately represents the brooklyn of today because i'm from brooklyn i'm from coney island so that is specifically another thing that's so great about that character is that peter parker that whole area where he used to live is it was white back then but now it's uh more black and jamaican and latino now so as the demographic shift it's a more modern interpretation of how brooklyn actually is yeah. in the modern day so i just want to say yes there is also that but he more accurately represents all of new york city in a way that peter parker it's not that he doesn't but it's the new york of today Mm -hmm. And that's what's really important for the kids who are reading this today to see. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go and take a few more questions. And shout out to OG for voicing Miles Morales in the animated oh, series. <laughs> thank you, OG. Hell one yeah. of the hardest, one of the hardest gigs. But thank you. Oh man, we appreciate you. <laughs> thank you for your service. You did a great job. Um, let's see what we have here. All right, so we have another question from Abdullah with <laughs> Home Things <laughs> being the norm. Do you think that made things easier or harder for people who want to get into the business? Um, I have a short answer to that. What was the norm? Yes, with home recordings being the norm, oh. Oh. do you think that made things easier or harder for people who want to break in? Oh. Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it's easier for people who aren't who aren't restricted by the barrier of entry because now it, it used to be if you were recording from home uh it was good enough to have maybe a 100 dollars usb microphone recording in your closet but now everything is going to broadcast from your home studio so now you have to have you know a, an expensive booth or sound arrangement and most studios won't even talk to you if you don't have a tlm 103 which is an 1100 dollars microphone so financially the barrier of entry is higher now than it ever has been mm -hmm. um one of the things that I hope to see as we kind of move out of pandemic, and I, I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully soon as we move out of the pandemic world, I, th I think it's important that we maintain both. That people who are capable of having the setup are not required to move to the major hotspots in order to get work, but people who can afford those, who can or already are in those areas, still have the opportunity to come into studios and still work. I think it's important that everybody still maintains the same level of opportunity to work. It's especially difficult for minorities. Um, it's yeah. really hard. It's unfortunately the fact of the matter is voiceover is an expensive business to, to even get into classes. You know, Mello was talking about we should do free workshops, which is, I am totally down for. I, I try to hold spaces every now and again, just offering advice on Twitter uh, because it's so expensive. A voiceover class for an hour can cost, can, you know, be $180, you know, some shorter workshops that only are two days or 600 plus dollars. And yes, they're very valuable, but not everybody has the money to spend. And I, I am the first to recognize my privilege in that I was able to drop out of college in order to pursue this. I was able to drive to Brooklyn to get an $800 booth. I was able to get the TLM 103 and all of that. Um, because my mother luckily made a lot of money because she was a very, very hardworking black woman. And she was in the software engineer. Uh, she was, she's a software engineer and she made a lot of money at the time. And so I could afford to do those things, but people in that don't have access to those so same sorts of things, maybe the same sorts of theater programs and, the, and, and education just don't have the money. So yes, you can do it from anywhere now, only if you have the money to do it from anywhere. Uh, which really, really sucks uh, for a lot of people. And I don't know how we're going to change that, but I, I think the easiest way is just for us as people in the position to give out as much of our own resource, which is just our own experience, um, we should just do it. I, I don't, I don't like people have asked me, oh, when are you going to start charging for classes? I'm like, I don't really feel comfortable with that. I, I'm just here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of my things, but yeah, it's very, it's, it's both, it's both. Yeah. It's easier and it's harder at the same time. 
Also, studios need to stop requiring a barrier of entry microphone that is yeah. completely independent of how your space is treated. Yep. Because there are microphones yeah, like a, a CLM, quarter of the cost of the 103 the, that can sound amazing yeah. if your space is treated right. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, the Norman TLM 103 picks up everything. But you don't have to have that. I nope. mean, I in 2019, I was still recording on an Apogee USB mic, and not for broadcast quality, but for auditions, a USB Apogee that I got secondhand on eBay and Twisted Wave, which is $5.99 for the App Store for your iPad or your phone. And in a well-treated space, you can get some broadcast quality out of that if you need to. I can vouch for that. And then when I did get my own studio, Andrew Monheim does, there are there are mics and Jason um, Lanier White is a great resource, but there are mics that are clones, they call them clones. Mm. And so they can clone that sound, um, but not the perfection A pristine Neumann or the, you know, the problem with the pristine mic is it's meant for a pristine environment. So we'll pick yeah. up everything. So an SM7 with a bib, um, which is a sheer SM7, it, it will not pick up all of the extra room tone and you can get them secondhand for maybe Two hundred dollars, yeah. or do a barter and a trade. I mean, um, the S eighty seven. Yeah, there are there are other ways. So do your research. That's where get get some free research, education, and training. Find out what we're using. But I've I've probably got ten series that are airing broadcast right now without annoyment. Yeah. Um, with a beautiful Monheim mic, it was custom made for me. But it, it's nice. it, it's like a TLM, like a a tube mic but it's got like the modern compression of a Manly, which is also a less expensive mic. So Manly has great reference mics, but look at what works for your space too. Yeah, well, um, that's, that's the that's other a thing good too. point Mark is saying, yeah. That that too, like I I think I sound awful on the TLM 103. I hate that microphone, Me it's too. too neutral. It's mm -hmm. too neutral, it sounds clinical even, mm -hmm. but I, I fought several studios for weeks going, can I please not use this mic? And they said, we need you to get it. And mm -hmm. I was in a position that I could, so I did. But there are there are mics out there. Yeah. Microphone, this is, we're so off topic here, but, but picking a microphone for your voice is like a whole thing. Yeah. They, you, they teach classes on that. You have to like know sound engineering. You have to know your voice extremely well. It's a long process of going through everything that you can to figure out what sounds best for your voice. And Unfortunately, work from home, it kind of got spread around really quickly that you needed two very specific pieces of equipment or no studio was going to work with you. And and it's just, it shouldn't be that way and it doesn't need to be that way. So it would be great to see going forward that we can kind of relax that a little bit and recognize that there are other microphones out there. There are other, uh, you know, interfaces out there that are just as capable of, of providing quality sound, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Bill? Super quick. This is a vocal boot to go. You can get it for like twelve hundred dollars. I literally use that to record all of One Piece, My Hero Academia, and nearly every other show you've heard me in over the past two years. It is worth it. Just get it. It's. it's here you go. I built my booth over the course of nine months. It, it <laughs> cost. It took nine months of time because I have no experience with carpentry at all. But I built it. <laughs> it you know under I think it was under two thousand dollars yeah. spread out over nine months. So okay, you know. folks. So um, we are approaching twelve twenty five, and I think we're just gonna go with one more question before we close it out. Would that be cool with you guys? Yes. Okay. Cool. Question for all. This is from Amina. When approaching coaches for VO development, what was your criteria for finding the best coach for you in the genres you wanted to work in, and how did you approach them? Excellent okay. question. Um, uh, I wanted to do, I do a lot of animation. So I targeted uh, working voice actors um, like Richard Horvitz and uh, Charlie Adler. And um, if I was a personal friend with the voice actor, if I worked with them before, like uh, OG, he, he uh, mentors me. He's someone I looked up to growing up and I just asked him questions as well. Uh, he became my voiceover Yoda. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying you're old or anything, but you know, you're just like, you know, experience. That's why I go crack, baby. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, whatever genre that, that you want to find someone that specializes in that. And yeah. Yeah. Well said, Cedric. Oh, man. Uh, um, performance Capture Podcast by Victoria Akin is free, but she interviews everyone 
in in the gaming and animation directors motion capture it's free what was that called again uh performance capture podcast Dope. it's Thank done you. by victoria <laughs> Atkin from cool. assassin's creed but free and super informative because then when you do meet a, a, a director or a casting director you want to work with you you know a little bit about their story you know that's why these panels are so important um voiceover network uk vaughn uk it's a worldwide organization but they have a lot of free workshops if you end up having enough money for i think the annual is 349 but they um have an archive of of workshops that you could just only do that um and so you know i know that's a step up but they also do offer uh really great workshops um i, I booked a, my first motion capture job off of that because uh i played a lot of young characters and this is funny this this director thought i was um a kid <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm a grown woman. I can do it. I can do it. Um, <laughs> what, was uh, was Jade motion capture, Mela? No, no. At that time, performance, face, and motion were done separately. Okay. Um, now for Lifeline, I get to do a little face face cap. Yeah, it is. Um, but I think the motion capture is done out of country right now. Um, but uh, also Real Voice LA. Um, I'm trying to Voice think. Voice Acting Network. Voice Acting okay. Network. Ace Studios. Yeah. So there's a lot of great studios. Um, but for those of you that are, you know, short of cash, again, just look for everything free. Almost everybody gives a free workshop before they give a paid workshop. Um, like AJ said, he's reaching out. I'll be doing once a quarter. I'll do a webinar. Um, follow the people that are in the projects that you love and can see yourself in. Reach out to us on Instagram or, or, or you know, privately. Ask questions. The worst that can happen is we don't respond or we miss your message. But put yourself in the space of your dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would say, especially now as the industry is sort of evolving, definitely look for people who are more accessible on social media, because I think there's more value in conversation than in workshops nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the reason why I say that is because in a workshop, a teacher is focusing on teaching what they know to six to 10 people. And mm -hmm. th there's a specific style of teaching there wherein you, you might not get as much individual attention. But if there's something that someone that you want to study with specifically one on one, reach out to them. You know, you may end up, you know, getting into just conversation and, and they may be willing to share with you um, advice, information, how they started, you know, what works mm. for them, what they think might work for you. You can get all of that in conversation. Yeah, and that's definitely. that's free. <laughs> so yeah. voice actors were very approachable people. Are. We're nice. Uh, we're the most seems way more accepting than other industries. Um, so yeah, we don't bite. Um, hit us Unless up. Unless you want us to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mark has a whole other Mark, hand. Down, boy. I'm just, down. I just, you know. That's a, that's, I, I reached out to No Shit um, uh, a couple months ago um, just because I was on a project and the director was like, you're new, you should reach out to No She's great. And I reached out to him because I was like, okay, sure. And I didn't expect him to respond, but he responded and really responded to my questions and really, you know, talked to me about my anxieties and stuff like that. You know, there are people that you wouldn't think are would want to take time out of their day to help you will uh, half the time. I won't say 100% of the time because you never know, but might as well send the message and see. Yeah. You miss all the shots that you don't take. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're Mark, you miss the shots you do take. Oh, no. Basketball was hard. Basketball was really hard. <laughs> Mark is my friend. Please. Adeto Kumbo, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say something. Yes, you'll get all this advice from people who are experts and incredible in their fields. But also remember what makes you uniquely you. You know, mm. nobody has your sound, nobody has your timbre, nobody has what is your superpower ultimately. Uh, and so just don't forget that as you venture into this world of voiceover, um, because something about you that's unique and interesting and amazing will land you an amazing job that I could never book. <laughs> you know, So just always remember that. And that's what a good coach will bring out. A good coach will bring that's out y you inside. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been coaching Eric Andre for the past five, six years now and like um, helped him get his first um, animation job and like in Soren Stinson. It's like, but it's tapping, but it's, important to find the right coach for you. There are so many out there, but when you click with somebody, mm -hmm. boom, stick with them. That's that's one thing I can say, because you can grow with them. They, they, they will know your voice. 
know all your faults, know all your know all your highs, know your lows, know know the tones and everything. They can really pinpoint when you have the right coach, you know, someone that really knows. That's it. Indeed, Charlie Senpai. Adler. Thank you, Senpai. <laughs> Charlie Adler uh, was like, a, I'm really glad I took his class because, you know, I feel like when I first started, I was very good at leaning into myself because when I first started voice acting was a hobby. Uh, so I did it for fun and I didn't think about like, what do the casting directors want or oh, what's a what's the typical sound that they want, blah, 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 blah. And I think when I took a class with him, because he's very much, he focuses on you, the individual, he focuses on your strengths and tries to bring you out as much as possible. And he's real as hell. What? Yeah. No, he oh, is. Yeah. <laughs> you need people that are real and raw. Exactly. Yeah. But when I took his class, you know, a, a lot of what he was kind of pushing out of me was like, uh, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, be more you. Don't be afraid to be you. And I think that's something uh, that I struggle with, not just, you know, I guess in performance, but also, you know, in real life, you know, being comfortable with my identity, being comfortable of who is me. And um, in the past year, uh, I've been struggling to kind of like let myself be me in my auditions. And I feel like I've gone to the point now where it's like, you know, yeah, I could do whatever the casting director wants, but what's fun to me. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I've been booking more things that require my natural voice instead of me putting on a voice um, and booking more commercial, which is especially yes, a lot of like what you bring to the table. So, you know, I uh, being you remembering you is very important and hold on to that as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right, we are at 12.32, so we went way wow. over <laughs> um, Let's end it here. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. I yeah. actually have a class I have to go to right now. Oh, I'll be signing yeah. soon. I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late, <laughs> but I will no. be off in a second. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.